Stone of Tears by Terry Goodkind, continuing on page 625. Warren turned his face up. Richard, please forgive me for telling you. I'm sorry I was the one to hurt you. You've always been... Richard put a hand to Warren's shoulder. It's not your fault. You didn't do it. You simply told me the truth. His voice felt as if it were coming from the bottom of a well. Thank you for the truth, my friend. All he could think, as his feet shuffled toward the door, was that his dreams were all dying. If he couldn't get the collar off, everything would be lost. Sisters Ulysia and Fenella both stood in warning as he came through the doors. They backed away, the same as the guards had when they saw the look on his face. A sparkling shield went up before the door. He went through it without slowing. The door beyond burst open for him without him touching it, part of the frame splintering. It somehow never occurred to him to use the knob. The prelate was sitting with her hands folded on the heavy walnut table. Her solemn eyes watched him come. Richard pressed up against the table, towering over her. I must admit, Richard, she said in a somber tone, that I have not been looking forward to this visit. His straining voice broke. Why didn't Sister Verna tell me? I ordered her not to. And why did you not tell me? Because I wanted you first to learn some significant things about yourself, so you would be better able to understand your importance, the burden of a wizard and of a prelate, too. Richard sank to his knees before her desk. Anne, he whispered, please help me. I must have the Radha Han off. I love Kaylin. I need her. I need to get back to her. I've been gone a long time. Please, Anne, help me. Take the collar off. She closed her eyes for a long moment. When they opened, they were heavy with regret. I spoke the truth, Richard. We cannot get the Radha Han off until you learn enough to help us. That will take time. Please, Anne, help me. Isn't there any other way? Slowly, her eyes staying on his, she shook her head. No, Richard. Over time, you will come to accept it. They all do. It is easier for the rest because they come here as boys, not understanding, and grasp it only over time. We have never had to tell one grown like you who can understand the significance. Richard couldn't make himself think clearly. It felt as if he were stumbling in a dark dream. But we'll lose so much time together. She will be old. Everyone I know will be old. Anne smoothed her hair back as she averted her eyes. Richard, by the time you are trained and leave here, the great-great-great-grandchildren of everyone you know will have died of old age and been buried in the ground for over a hundred years. He blinked at her, trying to comprehend the math of the generations involved, but it all turned to mush in his mind. He suddenly remembered what Shota had warned him of, a trap in time. This was that trap. He had been stripped of everything by these people. Everything he loved was gone. He would never see Zed again, or Chase, or anyone he knew. He would never hold Kalen again. He would never be able to tell her that he loved her, that he understood the sacrifice she had made for him. Chapter 63 Richard looked up from where he sat on the floor to see Warren in the doorway. He hadn't heard the knock. When he said nothing, Warren rushed over and squatted down beside him. Listen, Richard, something you said made me think. You said that you were going to wed the mother confessor? Richard's mind came out of the daze and his eyes suddenly came up. The prophecy is about her, isn't it? The prophecy you said would come on winter solstice. I think it might be. But I don't know enough about her, about confessors, to tell. Does the mother confessor wear white? Yes, the confessors are born to find the truth. She is the last one. Richard, I think that is good news. I think she is to find happiness and bring it to her people on winter solstice. Richard remembered the vision he had had in the Tower of Perdition. He remembered the horror of what he had seen. The words Kalin had spoken were burned into his memory. He quoted it to Warren. Of all there were but a single one born of the magic to bring forth truth will remain alive when the shadow's threat is lifted. Therefore comes the greater darkness of the dead. For there to be a chance at life's bond, this one in white must be offered to her people to bring their joy and good cheer. Yes, that's it. I believe that the greater darkness means both the keeper and winter solstice. I think that means... Richard, where did you read that prophecy? 
I didn't read it. It was brought to me in a vision of her. Warren's eyes grew big, the way they tended to do when he was astonished. You had a vision of prophecy? Yes. She brought me the words and also brought a vision of what it means. What does it mean? Richard brushed at his pant leg. I can't tell you. She said that I could speak the words, but not of the vision. I'm sorry, Warren, but I dare not violate that warning without knowing the consequences. But I can tell you that the results of this prophecy coming true would not be joyful for her or for me. Warren considered a moment. Yes, you are right. He looked over out of the corner of his eye. Richard, there is something about prophecy I think I should tell you. Hardly anyone knows this, but the words don't always reflect the true intent. What do you mean? Well, a few times when I have read prophecies, I've had a vision. The vision turns out to be true, and so does the prophecy, but not in the way you would think from reading it. I believe that the true way prophecy is meant to be understood is through the gift, through the visions. Do the sisters know this? No. I think this is what it means to be a prophet. Richard, if you had this vision and heard the words and saw the meaning, maybe that means you are a prophet. According to the prelate, I have a different talent. If she is right, then having a vision might just be part of my ability for what I truly am. Which is? The prelate said I'm a war wizard. His eyes widened again. Richard, war wizards have the gift for both magics. None with the gift for subtractive, too, has been born in... in thousands of years. Maybe the prelate is wrong. I hope she is. But it would explain some things. From what a friend of mine told me, additive magic is using what is, adding to it, multiplying it, altering it. The doing of things. Subtractive magic is the counter, the undoing of things. All the shields are put up by the sisters. They have only additive. Even those with the gift cannot easily go through them or break them because they also have only additive, power against power. But somehow I'm able to walk right through the shields around here without even trying. Subtractive magic would explain that. Subtractive would counter the additive of the shields, undo it. But you said you tried to go through the barrier that keeps us from leaving. That's a shield too. Why can't you go through that shield then, if you really have the subtractive? Richard lifted an eyebrow and leaned in. Warren, who put those shields in place? Well, the ones who placed the rest of the magic of the palace, the wizards of old, who you said had subtractive magic. That shield is the only one placed by them. It's the only one I can't go through. It's the only one my subtractive magic, if I truly have it, wouldn't counter. See what I mean? Warren sat back on his heels. Yes. He rubbed his chin as he thought. Well, that would make sense. It might fit with some of the prophecies about you. If you really are a war wizard, and are the one born true. And do these prophecies say, I will prevail? Warren hesitated. He glanced over at the sword of truth lying on the floor nearby. If I said, white blade, would that mean anything to you? Richard let out a heavy breath at the memory. I can turn the blade of my sword white through magic. Warren wiped his hand over his face. Then I think we might be in trouble. There is a prophecy that says, Should the forces of forfeit be loosed, the world will be shadowed yet by darker lust through what has been rent. Salvation's hope then will be as slim as the white blade of the one born true. Through what has been rent? The open gateway, Richard said. That would make the darker lust be the keeper. Warren, I have to do something about the prophecy, the one about the one in white. It's important. Do you have any ideas? Warren watched him as if trying to decide something. I do. I don't know if it will help. He put weight on his hands as he rubbed them on his thighs. They have a prophet here at the palace. I've never seen him. I want to, but they won't let me. They say it's too dangerous for me to talk to him until I learn more. They promised that when I learn enough, they will let me talk with him. Here in the palace? Where? Warren pulled a fold of his robes from under his knees. I don't know. It would have to be one of the restricted areas, but I don't know which one, and I don't know how we can find out. Richard stood. I do. Richard knew he had gone to the right guard when swordsman Kevin Andelmere turned white as a spirit at the mention of the prophet. He was reluctant, feigning ignorance at first, but when Richard gently reminded him of all the favors, Kevin whispered the location. The compound Kevin had divulged was one of the most heavily guarded. Richard knew where all the guards were stationed because he had gathered white roses there and had been up on the wall to look out at the sea. He also knew all the guards. 
They were frequent visitors to the prostitutes he provided. He didn't slow at the outer gate, but simply gave a nod to the wink the guards gave him. The guards at the rampart were considerably more reticent, stammering and holding out a hand to halt him. He shook the hand, pretending that he thought that was what was meant by it. They finally sighed and resumed their post as he marched by, his Mriswith cape billowing open. At the end of the rampart was a small colonnade, and at the end of that, winding stairs that led down to the prophet's quarters. The guards at the door he wanted were the two he had had trouble winning over at first, and the first to receive his gift of female company. They stiffened when they saw him. Richard casually made for the door between them. Walsh, ball's done. How you doing? They crossed their pikes over the door. Richard, what are you doing down here? The roses grow up top. Look, Walsh, I have to go see the prophet. Richard, don't put us in this spot. You know we can't let you in. The sisters would skin us alive. Richard shrugged. I won't tell them you let me in. I'll say I tricked you. If anyone finds out, which they won't, just tell them I snuck by and you didn't know until I was on my way out. I'll back your story. Richard, you really... Have I ever done anything to cause trouble? Have I ever done anything but help all you men? I buy you drinks, I loan you money when you need it, I let you have free access to the girls, and it never costs you a copper. Have I ever asked for anything in return? Richard had his hand on the hilt of his sword. One way or another, he was going through that door. Walsh pushed a stone chip with his boot. With a heavy sigh, first one and then the other pulled their pikes up. Bull's done, go make your rounds. I'm going to the privy for a sit. Richard took his hand from his sword and gave the man a pat on the shoulder. Thanks, Walsh. I appreciate it. Halfway down the inner hall, Richard felt layers of resistance, shields like the ones that were outside the prelate's door, but they only slowed him a bit. The room inside was as spacious as his own, but perhaps more elegantly appointed. One wall held large tapestries and another expansive bookshelves. Most of the books, though, seemed to be scattered about the room on chairs and couches and covering the blue and yellow carpets on the floor. Richard could see the back of a man in the chair beside the cold hearth. You must tell me how you do that, the man said in a deep, powerful voice. I would be most interested in learning the trick. Do what? Richard asked. Walk through shields as if they weren't there. Burns the flesh right off me if I try. If I ever figure it out myself, I'll let you know. My name is Richard. If you're not busy, I would like to speak with you. Busy? The man's shoulders shook with his hearty laugh. When he stood, Richard was a little surprised at how big he was. His long white hair had made Richard think he might be old and shriveled. Old he was, shriveled he was not. He looked strong and full of vitality. His smile was welcoming and threatening at the same time. He wore a Radahan, the same as Richard. My name is Nathan Richard. I've been looking forward to meeting you. I didn't expect you would find your way in alone. I wanted to come alone so we could talk freely. And do you know that I am a prophet? I didn't come here to learn to bake bread. Nathan's smile widened, but he didn't laugh. His brows pulled together like a hawk's. His voice took on a hiss. Would you like me to tell you of your death, Richard? How you are to die? Richard flopped down on the couch and plunked his feet up on a table. He returned the hawk-like glare and threatening smile, in kind. Sure, I'd love to hear all about it. And then when you're done, I will tell you how you are to die. Nathan lifted an eyebrow. And are you a prophet? Enough of one to tell you how you are to die. The frown turned curious. Really? Tell me then. Richard took a pear from a bowl on the table, polished it on his pant leg, and took a bite. He spoke as he chewed. You are going to die right here in these rooms of old age without ever seeing the outside world again. The creases in Nathan's face deepened as his expression sagged. Seems you are a prophet, my boy. Unless you help me. Maybe if you help me, I'll be able to come back here and help you get out too. And what is it you want? I want this collar off. A sly grin spread on Nathan's face. Seems we share a common interest, Richard. But the sisters say I will die without it. The sly grin widened. They demand truthfulness from others, but rarely inconvenience themselves with it. The sisters have their own agenda, Richard. There is more than one path through the woods. The sisters say I must learn to use my Han in order to get it off. 
they don't seem to be helping much in that. It would be easier to teach a stump to sing than for a mere sister to teach you to use your Han. You have subtractive magic. They can't help you. Can you help me, Nathan? Perhaps. Nathan sat down in his chair, leaning forward intently. Tell me, Richard, have you ever read The Adventures of Bonnie Day? Read it. It's my favorite book. I read it until my eyes nearly wore the words off the page. I'd love to meet the person who wrote it and tell him how much I liked the book. A broad, childlike grin stole onto Nathan's face. You just have, my boy. You just have. Richard came forward from the back of the couch. You? You wrote The Adventures of Bonnie Day? Nathan quoted a few passages to prove his intimate knowledge. I gave the book to your father to give to you when you were old enough to read. You were just born at the time. You were there with a prelate? She didn't tell me that. I doubt the truth occurred to her. You see, Anne doesn't have the power to get into the wizard's keep in Aiden Drill. I helped George get in so he could get the Book of Counted Shadows. They have some very interesting books of prophecy there. Richard stared in astonishment. Seems we are old acquaintances then. More than acquaintances, Richard Rall. Nathan gave him a meaningful look. My name is Nathan Rall. Richard's mouth dropped open. You are my great, great something or other? Too many greats to count. I am nearly a thousand years old, my boy. He waggled a finger in the air. I have had an interest in you for a long time. You are in the prophecies. I wrote The Adventures of Bonnie Day for some of those who had potential. It is a book of prophecy of sorts. A primer of prophecy, one you would be able to understand, so it would help you. It did help you, didn't it? More than once, Richard said, still having trouble keeping his jaw up. Good, I'm pleased then. We gave the book to a few special boys. You are the only one still alive. The rest died in inexplicable accidents. Richard finished the pair while he thought. He definitely didn't like the part about subtractive magic. So can you help me with using my power? Think, Richard. The sisters have not given you pain with the collar, have they? No, but they will. Fighting the last war, Richard. What did Bonnie Day tell the Warwick troops guarding the moors? That the enemy would not come the same way as they had before. That they were foolishly wasting their energy trying to fight the last war. Nathan lifted an eyebrow. You seem to have missed the lesson. Just because something happened to you before, that does not mean it will happen again. Think ahead, Richard, not behind. Richard hesitated. I had a vision in one of the towers, a vision that Sister Verna used the collar to hurt me. And it brought the anger forth, Richard nodded. I called the magic and killed her. Nathan gave a small, disappointed shake of his head. The vision was your own mind, trying to tell you something, trying to show you that you could defend yourself if they did that, that you could defeat them. It was your gift and your mind working together, trying to help you. You were too busy fighting the last war to heed the message. Chagrined, Richard kept his mouth shut. He had worried about them hurting him to the exclusion of everything else. He had ignored the true meaning of what Kalin had done because he had been so afraid of the past coming to life again. Think of the solution, not the problem. That was what Zed had taught him. He had been blinded to the future by the past. I see what you mean, Nathan, he admitted. What did you mean about the sisters not giving me pain with the collar? Anne knows you are a war wizard. I told her before you were born. I told her near to five hundred years ago. She would have given orders to the sisters. Giving pain to a war wizard is like kicking a badger on his rump. You mean that pain is somehow the secret to my power? No, the result of pain. Anger. He gestured to the sword at Richard's hip. You use the sword in that way. Anger calls forth the magic. Actually, you call the magic. It brings you anger, and so the magic works. Would you like me to show you how to touch your Han? Richard scooted forward. Yes. I never thought I would say that, but yes. I need to be able to get out of here. Hold up your palm. Good. He seemed to pull an aura of authority around himself. Now, lose yourself in my eyes. 
Richard stared into the hooded, deep, dark azure eyes. The gaze drew him in. Richard felt as if he were falling up into the clear blue sky. His breath came in ragged pulls, not of his own will. He felt Nathan's commanding words more than heard them. Call forth the anger, Richard. Call forth the rage. Call forth the hate and fury. Richard felt it, just as when he drew the sword. As he felt his breath being drawn for him, he felt the anger being drawn. Now feel the heat of that rage. Feel the flames of it. Good. Now focus those feelings in the palm of your hand. Richard funneled the rage of the magic to his hand, directed its flow, feeling its force. His teeth gritted with the power of it. Look in your hand, Richard. See it there. See what you are feeling. Richard's eyes moved slowly to his hand. A ball of blue and yellow fire tumbled slowly above his outstretched palm. He could feel the energy flowing from himself into the fire. He increased the flow of rage, and the angry ball of flame grew. Now cast the rage, the hate, the anger, the fire at the hearth. Richard threw his hand out. The slowly tumbling sphere of flame stayed with his hand. He looked to the hearth, focusing the rage outward, casting it away from himself. The liquid light howled as it streaked to the hearth, exploding there with a crack like lightning. Nathan smiled with pride. That is how it's done, my boy. I doubt the sisters could teach you that in a hundred years. You're a natural, no doubt about it. You are a war wizard. But Nathan, I didn't feel my Han. I didn't sense anything different. All I felt was angry, like when I used the sword. For that matter, like when I shut my finger in a door. Nathan nodded knowingly. Of course not. You are a war wizard. Others have only one side of the gift. They use what is around them. The air, heat, cold, fire, water, whatever they need. War wizards aren't like others. They instead tap the core of power within themselves. You don't direct your Han, you direct your feelings. The sisters teach the how of how everything is done. That is irrelevant to your power. For you, results are all that are important because you draw power from within. That is why the sisters cannot teach you. What do you mean that's why they cannot teach me? Have you ever seen a seamstress miss a pincushion? The sisters want you to watch your hand, the pin, and the pincushion. That's the way other wizards use their magic. War wizards don't watch, they just do. Their Han acts instinctively. Was that wizard's fire? Nathan chuckled. That was to wizard's fire what an annoyed moth is to an enraged bull. Richard tried again, but the fire wouldn't come. The anger wouldn't come. He could draw the sword's anger, but it wasn't the same kind he had done with Nathan from within himself. It won't work. Why can't I do it again? Because I was helping you, showing you with my own power what it's like. You were not yet able to do it on your own. Why? Nathan reached over and tapped Richard's head. Because it must come from in here, you have yet to accept yourself, who you are. You don't believe. You still fight who you are. Until you accept yourself, until you believe, you won't be able to call forth your Han, your power, except in great anger. What of the headaches that came from my gift? The sisters said they would kill me without the collar. The sisters nibble around the truth as if it were gristle in a piece of meat. They only eat it if they're starving. They want us prisoners so they can bring us to their ways. What they attempt to do when they train with you is what I have just done. The headaches are dangerous, but only if a young wizard is left alone with his power. When you had the headaches, were you able to make them go away? Yes. Sometimes when I concentrated on shooting arrows, or when something inside warned me of danger, or when I was angry and used the magic of the sword, then they went away for a time. That's because you were bringing the gift into harmony with your mind. The only thing required to keep the gift from harming you is a bit of instruction, like I just gave you. Teaching wizards should be a wizard's business. For a wizard, bringing your mind into harmony with your gift is a simple matter. Because it's the male gift teaching the male gift. What I have just done with you is enough to keep the gift from harming you for a good long time, without the Radahan. In the future, joining with a wizard will take you the next step and protect you until you reach the following plane. 
It's only important to have help available when you need it. The sisters need a hundred years to show you what I have just done. They use the collar as an excuse to take us prisoner for their own purposes. They have their own ideas about the training of wizards. Their idea is to control wizards. Why? They think wizards are responsible for all the evil that has befallen mankind, and if they color the power, control it, and indoctrinate it, they will bring the light of their theology to the people. They are zealots who believe they are the only ones who know the true way to eternal reward in the Creator's light. They feel justified in using any means to gain that end. You mean that what you have just showed me with my power is enough to keep the gift from killing me without the collar? It's enough to keep the gift from killing you, but it would take many more lessons to teach you to be a real wizard. All I have done is to hold the stallion's bit so he won't buck you off. It would take much more work to teach you to ride with grace. Richard could feel the muscles in his face draw tight. If this is true, then they are kicking the rump of a badger. Thank you for helping me. Richard rubbed his fingers together. Nathan, there is great trouble coming, coming very soon. I need to know a few things. Do you know the wizard's second rule? Of course. But you must learn the first before you have the second. I already know the first. I killed Dark and Rawl with the first. It states that people can be made to believe any lie, either because they want to believe it's true or because they are afraid it's true. And the counter to it? The secret is that there is no counter. I must be always vigilant, knowing that I too am vulnerable, and never arrogantly believe I am immune. I must always be alert that I can fall prey. Very good. And the second rule? Nathan's white eyebrows hooded his azure eyes. The second rule involves unintended results. So what is it? The second rule is that the greatest harm can result from the best intentions. It sounds a paradox, but kindness and good intentions can be an insidious path to destruction. Sometimes doing what seems right is wrong and can cause harm. The only counter to it is knowledge, wisdom, forethought, and understanding the first rule. Even then, that is not always enough. Good intentions or doing right can cause harm? Such as, Nathan shrugged, it would seem kind to give candy to a small child because they like it so. Knowledge, wisdom, and forethought tell us that it would make the child sick if we continued this kindness at the expense of good food. That's obvious. Anyone would know that. Say a person hurts their leg and you bring them food while they heal, but after time they still don't wish to get up because it hurts at first. So you continue to be kind and bring them food. Over time their legs will shrivel and it will be even more painful to get up. So you are kind and continue bringing food. In the end they will be bedridden, unable to ever walk again because of your kindness. Your good intentions have brought harm. I don't think that happens often enough to be a problem. I'm trying to give you obvious examples, Richard, so you will be better able to extrapolate to more difficult problems and understand an obscure principle. Good intentions being kind can encourage the lazy and motivate sound minds to become indolent. The more help you give them, the more help they need. As long as your kindness is open-ended, they never gain discipline, dignity, or self-reliance. Your kindness impoverishes their humanity. If you give a coin to a beggar because he says his family is hungry and he uses it to get drunk and then kills someone, is it your fault? No, he did the killing. But had you given him food instead or gone and given his family food, the killing would not have happened. It was a good intention that resulted in harm. Wizard's second rule. The greatest harm can result from the best intentions. Violation can cause anything from discomfort to disaster to death. Some leaders have preached peace, saying that even self-defense is wrong. It seems the best of intentions to shun violence. In the end, it often leads to a slaughter, where their threat of violence in the beginning would have prevented attack and resulted in no violence. They put their good intentions above the realities of life. They accuse warriors of being bloodthirsty when the warriors would have actually prevented bloodshed. Are you trying to say I should feel no shame at being a war wizard? It does the sheep no good to preach the goodness of a diet of grass if the wolves 
are of a different mind. Richard felt as though he were having a conversation with Zed. But kindness can always be wrong. Of course not. That's where wisdom comes in. You must be wise enough to foresee the consequences of your actions. But the problem with the second rule is that you can't always tell for sure whether you are violating it or simply doing right. Worse, magic is dangerous. When you add magic to the good intentions, violation of the second rule can lead to catastrophe. Using magic is easy. Knowing when to use magic is the hard part. Every time you use it, you can bring unexpected ruin. Do you know, Richard, that it's the weight of one flake of snow that is one too many and causes an avalanche? Without that one last flake, the catastrophe would not happen. When using magic, you must know which is the one snowflake too many before you add its weight. The avalanche will be out of all proportion to what you think the weight of that flake could invoke. Richard rubbed his thumb on the hilt of his sword. Nathan, I think I may have torn the veil because I violated the wizard's second rule. You did. What did I do? You used your magic through the wizard's first rule to win. In so doing, you fed magic to the boxes, the gateway, tearing the veil. You did it through ignorance. You didn't know that the unintended results of doing what seemed right could be the destruction of all life. One snowflake indeed. Magic is dangerous. How can I fix it? The stone of tears must be put back on the keeper. The lock, the seal, must be restored. The stone of tears must be sent back to its rightful place in the underworld, where it will serve to restrain the keeper's power in this world. To do that requires both powers. The key must then be turned in the lock, so to speak, by closing the gateway. This also requires both magics. Doing any of this with only one side of the magic would rip the veil, so a wizard with the gift for only the additive such as myself would be of no help. Only one such as you can accomplish the task. Until it is done, we are in terrible danger. If you act wrongly, use the stone for your own reasons. You have the power to destroy the balance and tear the veil the rest of the way, sending us all into eternal night. Richard stared at the table while he thought, do you know what an agent is? Ah, you must be talking about the trouble with the upcoming winter solstice. An agent is one who trades favors with the keeper, favors such as the innocent souls of children, in return for knowledge of the use of subtractive magic. He gave Richard a dark look. But that would not be a problem, because you sent Dark and Rall to the underworld, where he has no power here. Dark and Rall is in the underworld, is he not? Richard felt a gnawing pain in the pit of his stomach. He had not only torn the veil, but in violating the second rule again by trying to help with the gathering, he had brought an agent, Dark and Rall, back to this world where he could act to tear the veil. It was all Richard's fault. He felt hot and dizzy. He thought he might be sick at any moment. Nathan, I have to get this collar off. Nathan shrugged. I can't help with that. Richard had come here for a specific reason. He decided he had to try to get the answer. He cleared his throat. Nathan, there is someone very important to me. She is in danger, and I must help. There is a prophecy about her that is written down, but it also came to me in a vision. Which prophecy? Of all there were but a single one born of the magic to bring forth truth will remain alive when the shadow's threat is lifted. In his deep, powerful voice, Nathan finished the prophecy. Therefore comes the greater darkness of the dead, for there to be a chance at life's bond, this one in white must be offered to her people to bring their joy and good cheer. Then you know of it. Nathan, I saw the meaning of the prophecy. I was told not to speak of the vision, but it's not a joyful outcome as far as I'm concerned. She is beheaded, Nathan said in a quiet voice. That is the true meaning of that prophecy. Richard put his arm across his churning stomach. That was what he had seen in the vision. His world started spinning again. Nathan, I have to get away from here. I have to stop that from happening. Richard, look at me. Richard looked up, managing to hold the tears back. Richard, I must tell you the truth. If this prophecy does not happen, there is nothing beyond. We all die. It will be the end of all life. The keeper will have us. 
If you use your power to stop it, you will rip the veil asunder and allow the keeper to swallow the world of the living. Richard shot to his feet. Why? Why would she have to die to save the living? It makes no sense. His fist tightened around the hilt of the sword. I have to stop it. It's just a stupid riddle. I won't let her die for a riddle. Richard, a time will come when you have to make a choice. I have been hoping for a very long time now that when that time comes, you will be wise enough to make the right choice. You have the power to destroy us all if you choose wrongly. I will not stand here while you tell me I must let her die. The good spirits have done nothing to help. I must. I will. Richard stormed from the room. Cracks ran along the walls beside him as he marched down the hall. Chunks of plaster rained down behind him as he went. Richard only dimly noticed, but it pleased his temper. When he went through the shield, the paint on the walls to the side charred and curled. Richard's thoughts ran wildly in all directions at once. He knew now that his vision had been of what was going to happen if he didn't stop it. It was going to come true if he couldn't get away from the palace. Maybe that was what the prophecy meant, that he would be held prisoner there, and he wouldn't be able to help, and Kalin would die. In the courtyard below, Richard saw a commotion. Guards were running from everywhere. When he got closer, he saw one of the Baka Ban Mana blade masters. There had to be close to a hundred worried-looking guards surrounding him in a ring, holding their distance. The man in loose-fitting clothes in the center of the ring looked unconcerned. Richard pushed through the throng. What's going on? The man bowed to Richard. Kaharin, I am Jian. Your wife, Dushailu, has sent me to give you a message. Richard decided not to contest the wife part. What is it? I am to tell you that she has followed her husband's instructions. We have brought the Majendi to a peace with us. We no longer make war with them or the people here. That's wonderful news, Jian. Tell her I am proud of her and her people. Your people, Jian corrected. She wants you to know she has decided to bear the child. And she also sends message that we are ready to return to our homeland. She wishes to know when you will come to take us there. Richard glanced around at the people. Not only guards were gathered, but sisters too. He recognized a few of his teachers watching. Sisters Tovi, Niki, and Armina. Pasha stood nearby. At the far edge of the crowd he saw Sister Verna. On a balcony in the distance, beyond the walls, he saw the squat figure of the prelate. Richard turned back to Jian. Tell her to be ready, that it will be soon. Jian bowed. Thank you, Kaharin. We will be ready. Richard spoke to the guards in a circle around them. This man has come in peace. He is to be left in peace. Jian strode away unconcerned, as if he were alone on a walk, but the ring of guards moved with him as Richard knew they would until he was well clear of the city. The crowd started drifting away. Richard's head was pounding. He had brought his father back from the underworld by violating the wizard's second rule a second time in the spirit house. He had tried to do the right thing and instead had brought harm. Warren had told him that the keeper needed an agent to escape, and Richard had provided one. His mind reeled. He had just found out that Kalen loved him, and life seemed good again only to discover that he was to be trapped here for hundreds of years. And if he couldn't escape, Kalin would die on winter solstice. His thoughts went around and around in a desperate tangle. He had to do something. Time was running out. He decided to find the one person who might be able to help him. Chapter 64 She heard the voices in the outer office and hoped it was who she thought it would be. She was not looking forward to this, but she was running out of time. Richard would have surely found a way to see Nathan by now, and Nathan would have done his part. Now it was time to do hers. She couldn't completely trust Nathan, but in this, he would have done what was required. He knew the consequences of failure. His had been a task she didn't envy, adding the weight of that snowflake. With a flick of her fingers, the door swung open. She had had to have the carpenters fix the door frame. Richard had shattered it with his Han without even being aware of what he had done, and that was before he had even gone to Nathan. The curt speech cut off as the door opened, and the three faces looked in, awaiting instruction. Sister Ulyssia, Fenella, it's late. Why don't you two run along to your offices and tend to your paperwork? I will see her. 
Sister Verna, please come in. Anne stood as Sister Verna strode in. She liked Verna. She abhorred what she was going to have to do to her, but she was running out of time. Hundreds of years to prepare, and now time and events were slipping through her fingers. The world was at the brink. Verna bowed. Prelate Annalena. Please, Verna, sit down. It has been so long. Verna pulled a chair close to the opposite side of the table. She sat with her back straight and her hands folded in her lap. How good of you to take your valuable time to see me. Anne almost smiled. Almost. Dear Creator, thank you for sending her to me testy. Though it won't make my job any less onerous, it will surely make it easier. I have been busy. So have I, Verna snapped, for the last twenty-odd years. Apparently not busy enough. We seem to be having difficulty with a boy you collected and should have brought to task before he ever arrived. Verna's face turned scarlet. Had you not forbidden me from doing my duty using my skills, I would have done so. Oh? Are you so barren of resourcefulness, Verna, that you could not function with minor restrictions? Pasha, a mere novice, seems to be having better success, and she functions under the same restrictions. You think so? You think he is under control? He has not killed anyone since Pasha took over. Verna stiffened. I think I know something of Richard. I would advise the prelate caution in her confidence. Anne looked down, moving papers about, as if devoting attention to words she was not seeing. I will take your advice under consideration. Thank you for coming, Verna. I'm not finished. I haven't yet begun. Her eyes came slowly up. If you raise your voice to me again, you will be, Verna. Prelate Annalena, please forgive my tone, but there are matters of grave importance I simply must raise. Anne sighed, feigning impatience. Yes, yes, then please do get to it. I have much work to do. She folded her hands on the desk and gave Verna a blank look. Go on, then. Richard grew up with his grandfather. How nice for him. Verna paused in annoyance at the interruption. His grandfather is a wizard, a wizard of the First Order. His grandfather wanted to teach him. Well, we will see to his teaching. Is that all? Verna's eyes narrowed. I do not need to remind the prelate that it is a direct violation of the truce to take a boy from a wizard who would teach him. I was told that there were no wizards left in the New World to teach boys. I was lied to. I was used. We have been stealing boys. You made me a part of that. Anne smiled indulgently. Sister, we serve the Creator so all may learn to live in his light. Now, in view of our duty to the Creator, what is a truce with heathen wizards? Verna was struck speechless. Dear Creator, I like this woman so. Please give me the strength to break her. Nathan had added his snowflake. She had to add hers. I have been sent on a twenty-year chase without knowing the reason. I have been deceived. My two companions died, one at my hand. I have been forbidden use of my power to do my job. Do you think I forbid your use of your power capriciously? Is that what's bothering you, Verna? Very well, then. If you must know the reason, it was to save your life. Verna stiffened in caution. If I remember my lessons in the vaults, there is only one reason such restriction would save my life. Inwardly, Anne smiled. Verna wanted it spoken out loud. Indeed, Richard has subtractive magic. You knew that? You had one with subtractive magic collared? You would risk that? You would have him brought here to the palace? Her hands unfolded and she leaned in a bit. Why? Anne held the other's gaze. Because there are sisters of the dark in the palace. She didn't twitch. She knew. At least she suspected. Bless you, Verna. You are a bright one. Forgive me for what I must do. Is this room shielded? Verna asked in an even tone. Of course. She left unsaid that her shield would not protect against these sisters. Do you have proof of such an accusation, prelate? I do not need proof right now because this conversation is restricted. You will not speak of it unless you plan to bring charges. If you do, I, of course, will deny it and say a bitter sister was trying to accuse the prelate of blasphemy for personal gain. And then we would have to hang you. Neither of us wants that now, do we? Verna sat stiff and still. No, prelate. But what does that have to do with bringing Richard here? When your house is overrun with rats, the only thing you can do is bring in a cat. 
This cat sees us all as rats, maybe with good reason. Some might say that perhaps you were not bringing in a cat for your rats, but bait. Richard is a good person. I would not like to think he is being sacrificed. Do you know why you were selected to go after Richard? I had thought it was your vote of confidence. Anne shrugged. In a way, it was. Although I'm not sure that there are Sisters of Dark in the palace, and I have no idea who they are if it's true, I had to assume that if it is true, then since Grace and Elizabeth were at the top of the list, they would be Sisters of the Dark. I knew from prophecy that only my eyes have seen that Richard probably has subtractive magic, and further that he would refuse the first two offers. I knew the first two sisters would die. If the Nameless One's disciples knew any of this, they would want the third name on the list to be one of theirs too. I used my prerogative as prelate to pick the third sister. You chose me because you had faith that I was not one of them? What Anne wanted to say was, I have known you since you were a child, Verna. I know your quick mind, your heart, and your soul. You of all the sisters were the one I trusted with the fate of the world. I knew Richard would be safe in your hands. But she could not say that. I chose you, Verna, because you were far down on the list, and because all in all you are quite unremarkable. The room rang with silence for a long moment. Verna swallowed. I see. Anne affected dispassionate objectivity. Inside, her heart was breaking. I doubted you were one of them. You are a person of little note. I'm sure Grace and Elizabeth made their way to the top of the list because whoever directs the Sisters of the Dark considered them expendable. I direct the Sisters of the Light. I chose you for the same reason. There are sisters who are valuable to our cause. I could not risk one of them on such a task. The boy may prove a value to us, but he is not as important as other matters at the palace. He may be a help. It was simply an opportunity I thought to take. If there had been trouble and none of you made it back, well, I'm sure you can understand that a general would not want to lose his best troops on a low-priority mission. Verna's breathing looked forced. Her voice sounded it. Of course, Prelate Annalena. Anne shuffled her papers impatiently. I have important matters to get back to. Is there anything else, sister? No, Prelate. When the door closed, Anne lowered her face into her shaking hands. Tears dripped onto her papers. She appraised his eyes for a long moment. Richard didn't know if she would say yes or not, but he had had to tell her much of what he had learned just to get her to agree to listen to his plea. He couldn't afford to fail. He needed help. He had to trust someone. All right, Richard, I will help you. If half of what you say is true, I must help you. Richard sighed as he closed his eyes in relief. Thank you, Liliana. I'll never forget you for this. You're the only one around here who will listen to reason. Can we do it now? Time is critical. Now? She whispered harshly. Here? Richard, if what you say about you having subtractive magic is true, it won't be a simple matter to remove your Radahan. I will need to retrieve an object of magic that the sisters keep guarded. It's an aid used to amplify power. Maybe through that, and with your help, it will be enough to get the collar off. Not only that... But if the Nameless One is involved, there is no telling what ears or Han might be paying attention. Then when? Where? It has to be soon. She wiped her fingers over her eyes as she considered. Well, I think I can retrieve the object before tonight. So we could try tonight. But where? It can't be in the palace. It would be too dangerous. The Hagen Woods, Richard said. Everyone avoids the Hagen Woods. Liliana looked up. Richard, you can't be serious. It's dangerous there. Not for me. I already told you how I can tell if the Mriswith are coming. We'll be safe enough, and we won't have to worry about any sisters or Pasha stumbling by while we're trying to get this cursed thing off my neck. She let out a frustrated breath. At last, she laid a hand on his shoulder and, giving it a squeeze, smiled. All right. The Hagen Woods, then. With a stern look, she gripped his shoulder and held him out at arm's length. I'm violating a whole stack of rules by doing this. I know it's important and the right thing to do, but if they catch us before we can do it, they will make sure I never get near enough to you to ever again try. I'm ready now. Let's go. No. I must try to retrieve the aid first. She cocked her head to the side as she frowned. And I just thought of something else. They keep telling you not to let the sun set on you there. Why? Richard shrugged. Because it's dangerous. And after everything you've learned, you believe them? You trust them? Richard, 
What if they don't want you to let the sun set on you there because you might learn something useful? You said the Hagen Woods were placed there by the wizards of old who had subtractive magic in order to help those like you. What if the sisters don't want you to have that help? What if they are just trying to make you afraid so you won't discover it? Wizards first rule. Were they deceiving him? Was he believing a lie? You may be right. We'll go after sunset. No. We don't want to be seen together, and it will take me some time to steal the aid. Do you know where the long split rock sits in the stream to southwest corner of the Hagen Woods? I know the place. Good. You get there before the sun sets. You are the one the magic is for. Go in the woods by the split rock. Tie strips of cloth to branches so I can follow where you went and find you. I'll meet you there, in the woods, when the moon is two hands in the sky. And Richard, don't you dare tell anyone about this, or you will be risking not only my life and yours, but Kalen's too. Richard nodded with a smile of thanks. On my word, tonight then. He paced his room after she left. He was anxious to get this over with and be off. He was running out of time. If Dark and Rahl had the scrin bone, they were already out of time. But that was just foolish. How would he get it? He was a spirit. Maybe it was as Warren said, that the elements were rarely all in place. It was Kalin he was worried about. He had to help her. A knock brought him out of his thoughts. He thought it might be Liliana come back. But when he opened the door, a distraught Perry pushed into the room. Richard, I need your help. He pulled out a fistful of robes. Look at this. They promoted me. Richard glanced down the length of the simple brown robes. Congratulations. That's great, Perry. It's a disaster. Richard, I need your help. Richard frowned. Why is it a disaster? Perry threw his arms in the air as if it should be obvious to anyone. Because I can't go into the city. I'm restricted in these robes. I'm not allowed to go over the bridge. Well, I'm sorry, Perry, but I don't see how I can help you. Perry took a deep breath to calm himself. He looked up pleadingly. There's a woman in the city. I've been seeing her steady of late. Richard, I really like her. I'm supposed to meet her tonight. If I don't show up so I can explain, if I never show up again, she'll think I don't care about her. Perry, I still don't see what I can do about it. Perry grabbed him by his shirt. They took all my clothes. Richard, you could lend me some of yours. Then no one would recognize me, and I could sneak into the city and see her. Please, Richard, lend me some of your clothes. Richard thought a moment. He didn't care if he was violating some obscure rule of the palace. It seemed insignificant compared to what he was doing, but he still worried for Perry. The guards all know me. They will see it's you in my clothes and tell the sisters. Then you'll be in for trouble. Perry glanced away, frantically thinking. Night. I'll wait until night and then I'll go. They won't see so clearly who it really is at night. Please, Richard, please. Richard sighed. It's fine by me, Perry, if you want to risk it. Just don't get yourself caught. I'd hate to know I helped get you in trouble. He gestured to the bedroom where the wardrobe was. Come on, take whatever you like. You aren't quite my size, but I guess you're close enough. Perry added a grin to his sidelong look. The red coat? I can have the red coat? She'd like me in that. Sure. Richard led a giddy Perry toward the bedroom. If that is what you would like, take it. I'm glad someone will enjoy wearing the red coat. Perry sorted through the wardrobe, looking for a pair of pants and a shirt he thought would look dashing. I saw Sister Liliana leaving your room just before I came. He pulled out a ruffled white shirt. She one of your teachers? Yes, I like her. She's the nicest of the lot. Perry held up the shirt in front of himself. How does this look on me? Better than on me. You know Liliana? Not really. She just always gave me the shivers, those strange eyes of hers. Richard thought about Liliana's pale, pale blue eyes shot through with violet flecks. He shrugged. I thought they were strange, too, at first, but she's so bubbly and friendly that I don't even notice them anymore. She has such a warm smile that it's hard to see anything else. Chapter 65 Richard sat quietly with his legs folded and the sword across his knees. He wore his Mriswith cape so that Pasha and Sister Verna wouldn't know where he was. He didn't want either to know the sun had set on him in the Hagen Woods. Either would surely come after him if they knew what he was doing. He had found a small clearing high enough to be dry and had waited there since the sun had gone down. He could see the full moon through the tight tangle of branches and judged it about two hands high. He didn't know what was supposed to happen in the Hagen Woods when the sun set on you there, 
but so far it seemed as it always had when he had been there before at night. He returned Liliana's call, and she came out from behind a fat oak. She looked about at the woods. It wasn't a tentative glance, but a confident appraisal. She sat before him, crossing her legs. I got it. The aid I told you about. Richard smiled in relief. Thanks, Liliana. She pulled it from her cloak. In the moonlight, he could see it was a small statue of a man holding something clear as glass. She held it up, showing it to him. What is it? The crystal, this clear part here, has the power to amplify the gift. I don't have the power to get your Radha Han off, if it is true that you have subtractive magic, because I have only additive. You will hold this in your lap. When we join our minds, this will help amplify your power so I can use it and be able to break the hold. Good. Let's begin. She pulled the statue back. Not until I tell you the rest. He looked into her pale, pale blue eyes at the dark flecks spread through them. So tell me. The reason you can't help get the collar off is because you don't have the training to use your gift. You don't know how to direct the power. This will overcome that deficiency, I hope. You're trying to work up to warning me about something. She gave a single nod. You don't know how to control the flow, so you will be at the mercy of the aid. But the aid doesn't understand pain. It simply does what it must, what I need. So you're telling me it might hurt. I'm prepared to endure pain. Let's get started. Not might. She held up a cautionary finger. Richard, this is dangerous. It will hurt you. It will feel like your mind is being torn apart. I know you want to do this, but I don't want to deceive you. This will make you think you are dying. He felt a trickle of sweat run down his neck. It must be done. I will be directing my Han to try to break the hold of the collar. The aid will be pulling power from you to do as I need to overcome the Radha Han. It will hurt you. Liliana, I can take whatever is necessary. It must be done. You listen to me, Richard. I know you want to do this, but you listen. I will be pulling the gift from you to help break the collar. Your mind will feel like I'm trying to pull the very life from you. Your inner mind may interpret that as me trying to suck the gift, the very life, from you. You will have to endure the feeling of having your life ripped from you. You will have to endure it until the collar breaks. If you try to stop it when my power is in you, trying to do as I must... So what you are saying is that if it's too much and I want to stop, I can't. If I try to stop the pull on my magic, it will kill me. Yes. You must not resist. If you do, you will die. Her expression was as serious as he had ever seen it. You must trust me and not try to stop what is happening to you, or you will die, and then Kalin will die. Are you sure you can do that? Liliana, I would do anything, endure anything to save Kalin. I trust you. I will put my life in your hands. She at last nodded and placed the statue in his lap. She gazed into his eyes a long moment and then kissed her finger. She touched the kissed finger to his cheek. Into the void, then, together. Thank you for your trust, Richard. You will never know what this means to me. Nor to me, Liliana. What do you want me to do? The same as we have always done before. You just try to touch your Han as always, and I will do the rest. She wiggled forward until their knees were pressed together. They held hands, letting them rest over their knees. Each drew a deep breath and closed their eyes. At first it was the same as it always was, just deep relaxation as he concentrated on the image of the Sword of Truth. The pain at first was simply an uncomfortable tingling. It spiraled deeper, settling at the base of his spine, feeling like a pulled muscle. The pain worked its way up his back. Abruptly, it erupted everywhere at once, something like the pain of the Aegeal, a hot ache searing through the marrow of his bones. Denna had taught him to endure pain. He said a silent thank you to Denna for what she had done. Maybe it would be what he needed to endure this, to save Kalin. The twisting torture took his breath, his back stiffened, sweat instantly drenched his face, his lungs burned for air. With the greatest of effort, he drew a breath. Shattering pain exploded through his mind, plunging him into a timeless place of ripping, unending agony. He struggled to hold the sword in his mind. Tears ran down his face. He had to do this. It felt as if every nerve in his body were exposed and being held to a flame. He thought his eyes might burst. He thought his heart might burst. He flinched with each agonizing tug of pain. It was torture beyond endurance. And then it seemed 
as if what he had felt had not yet been the beginning of it. He was unable to scream, to breathe, to move. It seemed his very soul was being ripped from him. As Liliana had warned him, it seemed as if his very life were being pulled from him. He felt a wash of panic that this was killing him. He felt dark death soaking into the void left by what was being ripped from him. He dimly worried that this wasn't right. Terror burgeoned deep within him, and then that too was pulled into the swirling torrent erupting outward. He wanted nothing more than to scream, as if it would somehow ameliorate the agony, but he could not. His muscles seemed to be losing their life along with the rest of him. He could not breathe or even hold his head up. Please, Liliana, please hurry, please. He struggled not to resist what she was doing. He prayed that he would not fight her. He had to get to Kalin. She needed him. His eyes were open, he realized, when he recognized the statue in his lap. His head was hanging. The crystal was beginning to glow a dull orange. A dim part of him thought that that must mean it was working, doing its job. His head felt as if it were coming apart. He expected to see blood dripping down, but he saw only the orange glow increasing. Please, Liliana, hurry. Blackness was enveloping him. Even the insufferable pain was beginning to seem distant. He felt life slipping from his grasp. He felt an emptiness coming upon him that was more ghastly than anything he thought possible. In the fading recesses of his mind, he felt a presence. Mriswith. He felt them near. His level of alarm rose. They were around him, closing in. And then he heard, as if from a great distance, Liliana's voice. Wait, my pets. You may have what is left when I am finished with him. Wait. He could dimly see them wrist within his mind, as he always had when they came to him. When Liliana spoke, they moved back. Why would she say that? Why would the Mriswith move back at her command? What did she mean? Maybe the pain had driven him insane, and it was only a mad illusion. He felt a presence at his back. Not a Mriswith. Worse, more gruesome by ten. He felt its fetid breath on his neck. Liliana's voice came in a dangerous hiss. I said wait. The presence receded a bit, but not as far as the Mriswith. What did she mean? They could have what was left. He was dying. That was what she meant. He could feel it. He was dying. No. Liliana said he would think that. It was simply happening as she had said. That was all. He had to be strong for Caelan, but he had so little left to give. He was dying. He knew he was. The statue in his lap was glowing brighter. The hot breath returned to his neck. He heard a low growl from the loathsome thing. He vehemently wanted it away from him. Liliana's menacing voice came again. Wait. I will be finished in a moment, and then you may have his body. Wait. In that instant, something deep within him told him that if he was ever going to save himself, this was the last chance. It had to be now. The decision to act was sudden desperation. From deep within, from the core of his mind, from the core of his being, from the core of his soul, he wrenched his will to action. And by force of will, with frantic, colossal effort, he yanked his power, his life, himself, back. A thundering boom sounded, and an impact sundered the air, throwing the two of them apart. Richard landed on his back at one edge of the clearing, Liliana at the other. The sword of truth was in the center. The Mriswith and the other creature melted back into the darkness among the trees. Richard gasped for air. He sat up and shook his head. The statue lay on the ground in the center near his sword. The orange glow was gone. Liliana floated upward without effort. It looked as if an invisible hand had lifted her gently to her feet. The sight raised hackles on the back of his neck. She smiled wickedly. Richard hadn't thought Liliana to be capable of such a vile grin. It made his toes curl in his boots. Oh, Richard, I was so close. I've never experienced anything like it. You have no idea of the glory of what you have. But I will have it yet. Richard glanced at the sides, trying to decide which way to run. He felt like a fool, and at the same time was overcome by a sense of profound loss. Liliana, I trusted you. I thought you cared for me. She lifted an eyebrow. Did you? The slow smile returned. Maybe I did. Maybe that's why I was doing it the easy way. Now we do it the hard way. Richard blinked. What do you mean, the hard way? 
The quillion would have been the easy way. I have taken on the gift from many a male. But you resisted where they could not. Now I must skin you alive to have your gift. First I will have to disable you. You will lie helpless as I do it. She held out a hand. A sword floated out from behind the big oak, out of the darkness, and into her hand. With a shriek, she swept across the clearing toward him. Her sword flashed in the moonlight. Without thinking, Richard lifted his hand, calling his sword and its magic. The response was instant. The anger inundated him. He felt the hilt slam into his palm as Liliana swung her sword. The sword, the magic, the spirits were with him. He brought the blade up, blocking her strike. Dimly, Richard wondered why his sword didn't shatter hers. But then he was moving. The dance with death had begun. He countered her strikes, and she his. He evaded attacks that should have had him, and she thwarted attacks that should have had her. She spun like the wind, slipping away at the last instant. He felt as if he were fighting a shadow. No human could move the way she did. He could not move the way she did. Behind, he felt the sudden loathsome presence. He checked the thrust of her blade and spun, bringing the sword around with lightning speed. For an instant, he saw a snarl of fangs and a malicious glare. And then the sword made solid contact, and what was there was rendered unrecognizable as it disintegrated. He felt her blade coming and dove over the falling hulk. Rolling to his feet, he returned the attack. The night air rang over and over with the sound of steel on steel. Richard realized that her blade must somehow be like his. She had a weapon, the match of the Sword of Truth. Besides that, she had command of magic he could only imagine. He didn't have to imagine long. As the battle wound its way across the clearing, both straining with all the fury they could bring forth, she leapt back and sent a bolt of fire racing toward him. He dodged at the last instant, and it flew past, hitting a tree. The trunk exploded in a shower of splinters. The top of the tree crashed down around him, some of the branches knocking him from his feet. Liliana slashed through branches as thick as his arms to get at him. They splintered the way the trunk had. Richard scrambled out from under and fought her back into the thick woods. As they clashed over and over again while descending a steep hill, he began to analyze her tactics. She fought ferociously, but without grace, like a soldier in combat among the lines. He didn't know how he knew that, except it had to come from the spirits of his sword's magic. The way she attacked, slashing and swinging, left her open for a thrusting counterattack. Richard pressed that attack at her, but when he finally managed to thrust at her middle, the strike that should have found its mark slid to the side. She was protected somehow. She had the use of magic he didn't understand. Richard was exhausted and was fighting on the pure rage and fury of the magic. She didn't even seem winded. You can't win, Richard. I will have you. Why? You can't win in the end. I will have my reward. He ducked behind a tree, just missing a swing that sent wood chips flying. If you help the keeper escape, he will swallow all life. You think so? You think wrong. He will reward those who serve him. He will grant me things the Creator never could. He stabbed at her, but the sword slid to the side. He's lying to you. Her blade whistled past his face. Her calm, deliberate attacks were relentless. We have a bargain. My oath seals it. And you believe he will keep his end? Join with us, Richard, and I will show you the glory that awaits those who serve him. You can live forever. Richard leapt to the top of a rock. Never. She looked up with cold detachment. I thought this would be pleasurable, but I find I am growing bored. Liliana swept a hand out. Twisting, snaking lightning came from the hand, but it was not like any lightning he had ever seen before. It was black lightning. Instead of a bolt of light and heat, it was an undulating void as dark as the night stone, as dark as the boxes of Orden, as dark as eternal death. The dim, moonlit scene seemed a sunny day in comparison. Richard knew he was seeing subtractive magic. Liliana swept the black lightning across the rock beneath his feet. It effortlessly sliced a smooth-edged void through the rock. The remaining part he stood atop collapsed onto the half below. Trees behind for a good distance, severed in the same way by the same black bolt, crashed to the ground in a roar of noise. Richard lost his footing and toppled backward onto the steep slope, tumbling down the hill. He threw his arms out to stop himself when he hit the flat at the bottom and immediately rolled over onto his back. He looked up and gasped. Liliana was standing right over him, her sword held high in both hands. 
by where she was looking, he knew she intended to cut off his legs. He froze at seeing her sword commence its descent. What he was doing was not working. He had to do something else or he was going to die. Her blade was a blur in the moonlight. He released himself, gave sanction to his inner self, his gift. He would surrender to whatever was there or he would die. It was his only chance. He found the calm center within and did its bidding. He saw the sword of truth thrusting upward. His knuckles were white with effort. The sword was a white glow in the gloomy light. With all his force, he drove the hissing white blade into Liliana under her ribs. When the tip severed her spine coming out her back between her shoulder blades, she went limp. Only his sword and strength held her upright. Her mouth dropped open in a gasp. Her sword fell, sticking in the ground to the side. Her wide, pale eyes stared down at him. I forgive you, Liliana, Richard whispered. Her arms twitched in an uncoordinated manner. Terror filled her eyes. She tried to speak, but only blood frothed forth. There was an ear-splitting crack like a lightning strike, but instead of a flash of light, a ripple of total darkness swept through the forest. Its touch made his heart skip a beat. When it finished, the moonlight seemed dazzling, and Liliana was dead. Richard knew. The keeper had taken her. Before he had called the sword's white magic, knowing full well what it meant, this time he had done as Nathan had told him and let his instinct, his gift, call it forth. It had been a surprise to him, both the instant calling of the white magic and the fact that he had not consciously done it. Something within had known that that was what was needed to counter the keeper's hate that filled Liliana. Richard was left stunned by what had happened. He stared down at Liliana as he withdrew his sword. He had confided in her. He had trusted her. He realized that he was still where he had started, with the collar around his neck and no ideas of how to get it off. Collar or no collar, he had to get through the barrier that kept him here. He decided that he would go get his things from the palace, and then he would find a way through the invisible wall. As he wiped the sword clean on her clothes, he recalled how it had been in the center of the clearing, a good distance from him. He had somehow called it to him, along with the magic. The sword had flown through the air and come into his hand. He set the sword on the ground and experimentally called its magic. The anger, the fury, filled him as always. He held his hand out and willed the blade to come to him. It lay rock solid on the ground. Try as he might, it would not so much as twitch. Frustrated, he returned it to its scabbard. He pulled her sword from the ground and broke the blade over his knee. When he threw it aside, he noticed something white nearby. White bones gleaming in the moonlight were mostly all that remained of the desiccated corpse. Only the top half was there. He assumed animals must have gotten the rest, but then he found the pelvis and legs some distance away, tattered remains of a dress that matched the top half still surrounded the leg bones. Richard knelt, inspected the upper body. Animals had not touched it. There was not a single tooth mark on any bone. It remained now as it had fallen. With a frown, he saw that the bones of the lower spine were shattered. He had never seen bones splintered in such a way. It was as if this woman had been blown in half while alive. He knelt silently, staring, wondering. Someone had killed this woman. Somehow, he knew, magic had killed this woman. Who did this to you? He whispered down at the corpse. Slowly, a skeletal arm rose toward him in the moonlight, the fingers uncurled, a thin chain dropping down, dangling from the bones of a finger. Richard, his hair feeling as if it were trying to stand on end, carefully took the chain from the fingers. There was a single object on the chain. He held it up in the moonlight and saw it was a lumpy piece of gold formed into the letter J. Jedediah, Richard whispered, now knowing what made him do so. Chapter 66 as Richard approached, he noticed a commotion on the stone bridge. A crowd lined one edge, everyone looking down to the river. At the center, he eased his way through toward the low walled railing. As he did, he saw Pasha at the crown, too, leaning out over the stone, looking down. What's going on, he asked, as he came up behind her. Pasha spun at the sound of his voice. She flinched when she saw him. Richard, I thought... She looked back over the railing, down to the river, and then back to him. You thought what? She threw her arms around his middle. Oh, Richard, I thought you were dead. Thank the Creator. Richard pried her arms off and then leaned over, looking down to the dark river below. 
Several small boats, each with a lantern, were towing a body tangled in their hand-casting nets. In the flickering yellow light, he could see the red coat. Richard ran over the bridge and down the banks, reaching the shore as the men were landing the boats. Grabbing the nets from a man, he hauled them and their load up onto the grassy bank. There was a small, round hole in the lower back of the red coat. He rolled the body over and looked into Perry's dead eyes. Richard groaned. Wizard's second rule. Perry had died because Richard had violated it. He had tried to do something good with the best of intentions, and it had brought harm. It was Richard the Dakra had been meant for. It was he they thought they were killing. Pasha was standing on the bank behind him. Richard, I was so afraid. I thought it was you. She started crying. What was he doing in your red coat? I loaned it to him. He gave her a quick hug. I have to go, Pasha. You don't mean the palace. You didn't really mean what you said about leaving. I know you did. You can't leave, Richard. I meant every word. Good night, Pasha. He left the men to their grisly task and headed for his room. Someone had meant to kill him, and it hadn't been Liliana. Someone else was trying to kill him. As he was loading his things into his pack, he heard a knock at his door. He froze, a shirt half-folded in his hands. Then he heard Sister Verna's voice beyond the door asking if she could come in. Richard yanked the door open, preparing to launch into a tirade, but the look on her face caught the words in his throat. She stood woodenly, staring off at nothing. Sister Verna, what's wrong? He took her arm and led her into his room. Here, sit down. She sank to the edge of the chair. Richard knelt in front of her and took her hands. Sister Verna, what's wrong? I've been waiting for you to return. Her puffy red eyes finally sought his. Richard, she said in a subdued voice, I could really use a friend right now. You are the only one who came to mind. Richard hesitated. She knew his condition, though he now knew she couldn't get the collar off. Richard, when sisters Grace and Elizabeth died, they passed their gift to me. I have more power than any sister at the palace, any normal sister. I know you won't believe this, but I doubt even that will be enough to remove your collar. But I wish to try. Richard knew that she couldn't remove it. At least he was told that she couldn't. Maybe Nathan was wrong. All right, try then. There is pain involved. Richard's brow drew together in a suspicious frown. Why do I not find that surprising? Not for you, Richard, for me. What do you mean? I have discovered that you have subtractive magic. What would that have to do with it? You locked the Radahan on yourself. It locks on by using the magic of the one it is attached to. I have only additive magic. I don't think that will be sufficient to break the bond. I have no power over your subtractive magic. It will fight what I try to do, and that will hurt me. But don't be frightened. It won't hurt you. Richard didn't know what to do, what to believe. She put her hands to his neck at the sides of his collar. Before she closed her eyes, he saw a glazed look he recognized. She was touching her Han. Muscles tense, with his hand on the hilt of his sword, he waited, prepared to react if she tried to harm him. He didn't want to believe Sister Verna would harm him, but then he hadn't thought Liliana would ever hurt him either. Her brow wrinkled. Richard felt only a pleasant, warm tingle. The room vibrated with a dull hum. The corners of carpets curled up. Windows rattled in their frames. Sister Verna shook with effort. The standing mirror in the bedroom shattered. Panes of glass in the doors exploded as the doors to the balcony banged open. The curtains billowed outward as if in a wind. Plaster fell from the ceiling and a tall cabinet toppled over with a crash. A low moan of pain issued from her throat as the flesh on her face trembled. Richard seized her wrists and pulled her hands from his collar. She sagged forward. Oh, Richard, she said in a mournful voice. I'm sorry, I can't do it. Richard took her in his arms and held her tight. It's all right. I believe you, sister. I know you tried. You have found a friend. She squeezed him tight. Richard, you have to get away from this place. He sat her back in the chair as she wiped her fingers at the lower lids of her eyes. Richard rocked back on his heels. Tell me what's happened. There are sisters of the dark in the palace. Sisters of the dark? What does that mean? The sisters of the light work to bring the light of the Creator's glory to the living. Sisters of the dark serve the keeper. It has never been proven that they even exist. The accusation without proof is a crime. 
Richard, I know you aren't going to believe me. I realize this sounds like I'm just... I killed Sister Liliana tonight. I believe you. She blinked at him. You did what? She told me she was going to take my collar off. She had me meet her in the Hagen Woods. Sister Verna, she tried to take the gift from me for herself. She can't do that. A female cannot take on the gift of a male or the other way around. It isn't possible. She said she had done it many times before. It seemed possible to me when she was trying. I could feel her pulling the life, the gift, right out of me. She almost succeeded. I came close to death. She brushed back her curly hair. But I don't see how... Richard pulled out the statue. She was using this. The crystal started glowing orange when she was doing it. Do you know what it is? Sister Verna shook her head. I think I've seen it before somewhere, but I can't remember. It was so long ago, before I left the palace. What happened then? When that didn't work, because I used my power to stop her, she called a sword from the shadows. She wanted to wound me. She said she was going to skin me alive and then steal my gift for herself. She tried to cut off my legs. Somehow I got her first. Sister Verna, she had subtractive magic. I saw her use it. Not only that, but someone else is trying to kill me. I loaned my red coat to Perry. They just dragged his body out of the river. He had been stabbed in the back with a dakra. She grimaced. Oh, dear creator. She twined her fingers together in her lap. The palace knows you have subtractive magic. They're using you to flush out the keeper's disciples. She took his hand. Richard, I've been a part of this. I should have long ago questioned things that were wrong, but I didn't. I instead did as I thought was right. Questioned what? Forgive me, Richard. You should never have had a Radha Han put around your neck. It wasn't necessary. I was told there were no wizards in the New World to help boys. I thought you would die without our help. Your friend Zed could have kept the gift from harming you. The prelate knew there were wizards to help you. She let you be stolen from your friends and loved ones for her own selfish reasons. You didn't need the Radha Han to save your life. I know. I talked to Nathan. He told me. You went to the prophet? What else did he say? That I have more power than any wizard born in 3,000 years, but I have no idea how to use it, and that I have subtractive magic. He said that the sisters could not remove the collar. I'm so sorry I brought this upon you, Richard. Sister Verna, you were deceived, as was I. You're a victim, too. They've used both of us. There is worse trouble. There is a prophecy that says that on winter solstice, Kalin is going to die. I must stop that from happening. And Dark and Rall, my father, an agent of the Keeper, is in this world. You saw the mark he burned on me. He is an agent who can tear the veil if he has all the elements in place, though I doubt he does. Sister Verna, I have to get away from here. I must get through the barrier. I'll help you. Somehow I'll help you get through the barrier. Your problem will be the Valley of the Lost. I don't think you can get through the valley again. Now that the caller has helped your subtractive magic grow, you will call the spells to you. The magic will find you this time. I might have a way. I must try. Sister Verna thought a moment. The keeper would want to stop you if there is a possibility for this prophecy about his agent to come to pass. The Sisters of the Dark will work to stop you. I am sure Liliana wasn't the only one. Who placed her as my teacher? The prelate's office assigns teachers. But the prelate probably wouldn't have done it herself. Such matters are usually handled by her administrators. Her administrators? Sisters Ulyssia and Fenella. I thought they were her guards. Guards? No. Maybe in a bureaucratic sense. The prelate has more power than they. She doesn't need guards. Some of the boys think of them as guards because they are always turned away from the prelate's door by the two sisters. They do some of their work in the prelate's office, and they have their own offices where they handle a variety of administrative tasks. Maybe the Sisters of the Dark came after me, decided they had to act now because they had been discovered. No, the prelate told me no one but she knows. Could anyone have overheard? No, she shielded the room. Richard leaned in. Sister Verna, Liliana had subtractive magic. The prelate's shield would not have worked against that. One of those two administrators assigned Sister Liliana to me. She drew a sudden breath. And the other five, if one or both of those two in the outer office heard what the prelate knows, then the prelate... Sister Ulysses' office, that's where I saw that statue. Richard grabbed her wrist and yanked her from the chair. Come on. 
If they tried to kill me, they may try to kill the prelate before she warns anyone else. The two of them raced down the stairs and out of Gillom Hall. They crossed the lawns in the darkness, ran down halls and through passageways. Kevin wasn't there. Another guard was on duty, but he didn't stop them as he too knew Richard, and sisters were not restricted. Page 655. Richard knew they were too late when he saw the charred doors to the prelate's office broken from their hinges. He slid to a stop on the slick marble floor of the hall. Papers and ledgers were scattered out into the hall. Sister Verna was still running down the hall as he went into the office with his sword drawn. It looked as if a thunderstorm had been turned loose inside. What was left of Sister Fenella lay on the floor behind her desk. The rest of her was splattered across the wall. He heard Sister Verna gasp as he kicked in the door to the prelate's office. When the door swung back, Richard dove through and rolled to his feet with his sword in both hands. The prelate's room was more of a mess than the outer room. Papers were nearly a foot deep over most of the floor. It looked as if all the books from the shelves had exploded, throwing the pages everywhere. The heavy walnut table was in splinters against the far wall. The room was in near darkness. Only the doorway behind and the open doors to the moonlit garden led in any light. Sister Verna lit a bright flame in her palm. In the sudden illumination, he saw a form at the far end of the room near the overturned table. The head came slowly up, the eyes locked on his. It was Sister Ulyssia. Richard dove to the side as a bolt of blue lightning blasted through the room, ripping open the wall behind. Sister Verna returned the attack with a searing gout of yellow flame. Sister Ulyssia dove through the doorway into the courtyard to avoid the fire. Richard went after her. Sister Verna ran to the overturned, splintered table, pawing scraps away. Duck! Richard screamed back to her. A twisting rope of the black lightning sliced through the walls right over his head as he flattened to the floor. Severed bookshelves crashed down. He could see through the void sliced by the black lightning into the next room and the rooms beyond. Plaster and lath and stone collapsed down, raising boiling clouds of dust. In a fury without thinking, Richard came to his feet when the black lightning ceased and ran outside. He saw a dark form running down the path. Again, black lightning arced from the shadows. The snaking void raked the courtyard. Trees toppled over, limbs snapping and popping as the trees fell. A stone wall collapsed when it was sliced in two. The noise was deafening. When it stopped, Richard sprang to his feet again. He was just about to start running down the path to find her when an invisible hand snatched him, yanking him back. Richard! Sister Verna's growl was as strong as he had ever heard it. Get in here! He returned to the prelate's room, panting when he stopped over Sister Verna. I have to go. She shot to her feet and grabbed his shirt in her real hand. Go what? Go get killed? What good will that do? Will that help Kalen? Sister Ulyssia is a master of powers you cannot even imagine. But she might get away. At least you will be alive when she does. Now come help me with this table. I think the prelate is still alive. Hope leapt to life in him. Are you sure? Richard started pulling the broken pieces away, throwing them behind. He found the body at the bottom of the debris. Sister Verna was right. The prelate was alive, but looked seriously hurt. Sister Verna used her power to lift heavy pieces of the table and bookcases clear, while Richard carefully pulled lesser chunks off the small woman. She was wedged into the bottom bookshelf against the wall and covered with blood. She groaned when Richard gently put his hands around her and drew her out. He didn't think she was long for this life. We have to get help, he said. Sister Verna's hands played over the prelate's body. Richard, this is very bad. I can feel some of her injuries. It's more than I can help with. I don't know if anyone will be able to help with this. Richard lifted Anne in his arms. I can't let her die. If anyone can help her, it's Nathan. Come on. Guards and sisters came rushing, having heard the deafening roar of the power Sister Ulyssia had unleashed. Richard didn't stop to explain as he made for Nathan's compound. He tried to hold Anne gently as he ran, but he knew by her groans that he was hurting her. Nathan came in from his courtyard when he heard them call. What was all that noise? What is it? What's happened? It's Anne. She's been hurt. Nathan led him into the bedroom. I knew that stubborn woman was asking for trouble. Richard laid Anne gently on the bed and stood near as Nathan experimentally glided his spread fingers over the length of her. Sister Verna waited and watched from the doorway. Nathan pushed up his sleeves. This is serious. 
I don't know if I can help her. Nathan, you have to try. Of course I do, boy. He made a shooing motion with his hands. You two go wait out there. This will take a while. At least an hour or two before I know if what I can do will help enough. Leave me to it. You can be of no help. Sister Verna sat with her back stiff while Richard paced. Richard, why do you care so much what happens to the prelate? She had you taken when she shouldn't have. Richard combed his hair back with his fingers. I guess because she had the chance to take me when I was little, and she didn't. She let me grow up with my parents. She let me have their love. What else is there to life but the chance to be nurtured by love? She could have taken that too, but she didn't. I'm glad then that you are not bitter. Richard paced and thought. He didn't pace for long. Sister, I can't sit here doing nothing. I'm going to talk to the guards. We need to know where those teachers of mine are and what they're doing. The guards will find out for me. I suppose it couldn't hurt. Go talk to the guards. It will make the time pass more quickly. Richard strode down the dark stone corridors, deep in thought. He needed to find out where sisters Tovi, Cecilia, Marissa, Niki, and Armina were. Any or all could be sisters of the dark. Who knew what they were planning next? They could all be looking for him. They could all be... Stunning pain hurled him back. It felt as if he had been whacked across the face with a club. He staggered to his feet, the world spinning and tipping. He dumbly felt for blood, but there was none. Another blow smashed into the back of his head. He pushed himself up on his hands, trying to decipher where he was. His thoughts came thick and slow. He struggled to understand what was happening. A dark shadow stood over him. With an effort and halting movements, he came to his feet again. He groped for his sword, but couldn't remember which hand to use. He couldn't make himself move fast enough. Out for a walk, country boy. Richard looked up at a smirking Jedediah, standing tall, with his hands in opposite sleeves. Richard found the hilt of his sword. He sluggishly worked at drawing it. He lurched back as he battled to bring the magic forth. As the rage flooded into his foggy brain, Jedediah pulled his hands out. He had a dakra. His arm lifted the silver knife in his fist. Richard wondered what he should do, and if this was real. Maybe he would wake and find it only a dream. At the apex of his swing, light seemed to come from within Jedediah's eyes, slowly at first, and then with gathering speed. Jedediah toppled forward, slamming face first to the stone floor. A ripple of heart-stopping darkness swept through the corridor. When the torchlight returned, Sister Verna was standing behind where Jedediah had stood. She had a docker in her hand. Richard collapsed to his knees, still trying to gather his wits. Sister Verna rushed forward, putting her hands to the sides of his head. Alertness jolted into his mind. As he came to his feet, he glanced down at the body, seeing a small round hole in the back. I thought I had better go talk to some of the sisters, she explained. I realize that the more people who know about the Sisters of the Dark, the better. He was the one, wasn't he? He was the one you loved. She slipped the Dakra back up her sleeve. He wasn't the Jedediah I knew. The Jedediah I knew was a good man. I'm sorry, Sister Verna. She nodded absently. You go talk to the guards. I'll talk to the Sisters. Meet me back in Nathan's room when you're through. I think it best if we catch a few hours sleep there instead of our rooms. I think you're right. We can get our things when it's light and then be off. When he heard Nathan come into the room, Richard sat up in the chair and rubbed his eyes. Sister Verna rose more quickly from the couch. Richard blinked, trying to banish the haze of sleep. They both had been up late. The whole palace was in an uproar. What had happened in the prelate's office was proof enough of the mythical Sisters of the Dark. Doubters had only to take one look at the smooth-edged voids that lined up through a dozen walls, or the cleanly sliced trees and stone, to know that nothing short of subtractive magic had been used. Richard had sent the guards out to look discreetly for the six sisters. Sister Ulyssia and his five teachers, the sisters, were searching too. He had also gone to talk to Warren, to tell him what had happened. Richard stretched his legs as he stood. How is she? Is she going to recover? Nathan looked haggard. She's resting more comfortably, but it's too soon to tell. When she has rested, I will be able to do more. Thank you, Nathan. I know Anne could be in no better hands than yours. He added a grunt to his sour expression. You're asking me to heal my jailer. 
Anne will appreciate it. Perhaps she will rethink your being held. If she doesn't, I'll come back and see what I can do. Come back? Going somewhere, my boy? Yes, Nathan, and I need your help. If I help you, you might get it in your obstinate head to go off and destroy the world. And do the prophecies say you were sent to stop me? Nathan let out a tired sigh. What is it you want? How can I get through the barrier? My collar stops me. What makes you think I would know? Richard took an angry stride toward the towering old wizard. Nathan, don't play games with me. I'm in no mood and this is too important. You've been through. You went with Anne to get the book from the wizard's keep in Aidendrill, remember? He smoothed his sleeves down. It's a simple matter of shielding the Radahan. Anne helped me through. Sister Verna can do the same for you. I'll tell her how. And what of the Valley of the Lost? Can I get back through that? Nathan, his eyes suddenly intent with a dark look, shook his head. You have called too much power to yourself. The collar has helped it grow. You'll also call the spells. Sister Verna can't pass again. She has been through twice already. Additionally, she has too much power now. With passing twice and taking the gift of the other two sisters, she is locked here. Then how did you ever get through three times? You're from Dahara. That's once. You went to the New World again with Anne and came back. That makes three times. How did you do it if it can't be done? A sly smile came to his lips. I did not go through the valley three times, only once. He held up a hand to silence Richard's arguments. Anne and I didn't go through the valley. We went around the obstacle. We sailed around the ambit of the spells, far out to sea, landing finally in the southernmost reaches of Westland. It's a long journey and not easily done, but we made the crossing. Not many do. By sea. Richard glanced back to Sister Verna. I don't have that kind of time. Winter solstice is not even a week away. I have to go through the valley. Richard, Sister Verna said in a soft voice, I can understand how you feel. But it will take almost that much time just to reach the Valley of the Lost. Even if you find a way through, there is no time to get you where you want to go. Richard controlled his rage. I am inexperienced at being a wizard. I cannot count on my gift. For that matter, I don't care if I ever learn to use it. But I am also the seeker. In that, Sister Verna, I am not so inexperienced. Nothing is going to stop me. Nothing. I have made a promise to Kaelin that if I must go to the underworld and battle the Keeper himself in order to protect her, I will do it. Nathan's expression darkened. I have warned you, Richard. If that prophecy is not allowed to take place, the Keeper will have us all. You must not try to stop it. You have the power to hand the world of the living to the Keeper. It's just a meaningless riddle, Richard growled in frustration, though he knew better. Nathan's scowl was the scowl of a rawl, the scowl Richard had inherited. Richard, death is intrinsic to life. The Creator brought it to be, too. If you make the wrong choice, all the living will pay the price of your pertinaciousness. And Richard, don't forget what I told you about the Stone of Tears. If you misuse it to banish a soul to the depths of the underworld, you will destroy the balance between everything. Stone of Tears, Sister Verna said in a suspicious tone. What would Richard have to do with the Stone of Tears? Richard turned back to Sister Verna. We're running out of time. I'm going to my room to get my things. We need to be on our way. Richard, Nathan said. Anne has put her faith in you. She let you have the love of your family so that perhaps you will better understand the true meaning of life. Please consider that when the time for choice is upon you. Richard looked up at Nathan for a long moment. Thank you for your help, Nathan. But I won't let the one I love die for a riddle in an old book. I hope to see you again. There is much for us to talk about. Richard dumped the bowl full of gold coins into the bottom of his pack before stuffing the rest of his things in. He reasoned that if it helped him save Kaelin, then it was the least the palace could do, after all they had done to him. The gold had been a kindness that lulled the rest of the young men at the palace into laziness. It harmed their humanity, as Nathan had said. Maybe that was why Jedediah turned to promises from the keeper. Richard doubted that any of the young wizards except Warren had done a day's work since they had come here and had ready access to unlimited gold, but no knowledge of its value. Just one more way the Palace of the Prophets destroyed lives. He wondered how many children of young wizards that gold had spawned. 
Richard went out onto the balcony to take stock before he left. Guards were patrolling the grounds. Sisters, too, were diligently searching every building and covered corridor. The sisters would have to somehow deal with those six. He certainly had no idea how to contain their power. When he heard the door in the front room, he assumed it would be Sister Verna. They had to get going. When he turned and looked, he had no time to react. Pasha was storming through the room toward him. She threw her hands up. The doors blew off their hinges and over the balcony railing, falling the 30 feet to the stone-paved courtyard below. The impact of the solid wall of air threw him back. Only the railing prevented him from being thrown over with the splintered doors. The wind had been knocked from his lungs, and a sharp pain in his side prevented him from taking another breath. As he staggered away from the edge of the balcony, another blow threw him back once again, this time hammering his head against the stone railing. He saw a shocking spray of blood hit the stone before the slate floor collected him. Pasha was screaming in a rage. At first, her words were nothing but an incoherent buzz in his mind. He pushed himself up with his hands. Blood was running from his head. A pool of it spread beneath him. Reeling, he toppled to his side. He managed to sit up and flop back against the railing. Pasha, what? Keep your filthy mouth shut. I won't hear any of it. She was standing in the doorway, fists at her sides. One fist held a dakra. Tears streamed down her cheeks. You're the keeper's spawn. You're an obscene disciple of the keeper. You do nothing but hurt good people. Richard put his hands to his head. They came away covered with blood. He was so dizzy he had to fight the urge to be sick. What are you talking about? He managed to mumble. Sister Ulyssia told me. She told me you served the keeper. She told me how you killed Sister Liliana. Pasha, Sister Ulyssia is a sister of the dark. She told me you would say that. She told me how you used your vile magic to kill Sister Fenella and the prelate. That's why you were always wanting to go to the prelate's office, so you could kill our leader in the light. You are filth. The world swam before his eyes. He saw two of her moving around and around each other. Pasha, that's not true. Only the keeper's tricks saved you yesterday. You gave someone else the coat I loved to humiliate me. Sister Ulyssia told me how the keeper whispers in your ear. I should have killed you when I saw you on the bridge. Then none of this would have happened. But I foolishly thought I could save you from the keeper's clutches. Those sisters and the prelates would be alive now had I finished the job. I failed the creator when you tricked me into killing Perry. But that will not save you again. Your vile underworld tricks will not save you again. Pasha, please just listen to me. You're being lied to. Please listen. The prelate isn't dead. I can take you to her. You wish to kill me too? That's all you ever talk of, killing. You profane us all. And to think I could have ever thought I loved you. She raised the dakra and with a scream ran for him. Richard somehow managed to pull the sword, woozily wondering which image of her to try to stop. The anger of the magic of the sword brought strength to his arms. He brought the sword up as she dove for him, dakra first. The two images of her converged. The sword never touched her. With a shriek, she was propelled over the railing above him. She screamed all the way down. Richard's eyes winced shut when he heard her scream terminate as she hit the stone. Richard opened his eyes to see a stunned Warren standing in the doorway. He remembered Jedediah's fall on the stairs. Oh, dear spirits, no, Richard whispered. He levered himself to his feet and took a quick glance over the edge. People rushed from different directions toward the body. Warren was shuffling woodenly toward the railing. Richard stopped him halfway there. No, Warren. Don't look. Tears welled up in Warren's eyes. Richard put his arms around his friend. Why did you do that, he thought. I could have done it. I was going to do it. You didn't have to. Over Warren's shoulder, Richard saw Sister Verna standing in the room. She killed Perry, Warren said. I heard her admit it. She was going to kill you. I could have done it, Richard thought. You didn't need to. But instead, he said, Thank you, Warren. You saved my life. She was going to kill you, he cried against Richard's shoulder. Why would she do that? Sister Verna put a comforting hand to Warren's back. She was lied to by the Sisters of the Dark. The Keeper filled her mind with lies. She heard the whispers of the darkness. The Keeper can make even the good listen to his whispers. You did a brave thing, Warren. Then why do I feel so ashamed? I loved her and I killed her. Richard simply held him as he wept. Sister Verna pulled them back into the room. She made Richard bend over as she examined his head.
blood was dripping all over the floor. This must be tended to. I can't fix this much damage. I can, Warren said. I'm fair at healing. Let me do it. When Warren had finished, Sister Verna made Richard hold his head over the basin while she poured the ewer of water over him, washing off the blood. Warren sat on the edge of a chair, his head in his hands. Richard thought that he was going to need the basin. Warren's head came up when the sister finished. I figured out the rule you told me about. People will believe a lie because they want to believe it's true or because they are afraid it is. Just like Pasha believed a lie. Am I right? Richard smiled. You are, Warren. Warren managed a weak smile. Sister Verna, can you take this collar off me? Sister Verna hesitated. You would have to pass the test of pain, Warren. Sister, Richard said, what do you think you just did? What do you mean? The young wizards sent back through the valley are able to pass because they don't have sufficient power to draw the spells to them. They are not full wizards. Zed told me that wizards have to pass a test of pain. Over the millennia, the sisters have convoluted that into making them endure physical pain. I think they're wrong. I think the test Warren just passed is more pain than the sisters could ever give. Am I right, Warren? He nodded, his face going white again. Nothing they ever did hurt like this. Sister, remember when I told you how I turned the blade white and killed that woman by loving her? Maybe that, too, was a form of the test of pain. I know how much that hurt. She spread her hands in dismay. Do you really think that one with the gift must kill someone they love to pass the test? Richard, that can't be. No, sister, they don't have to kill someone they love. But they must prove they can make the right decision. They must prove they have what it takes to choose the greater good. Would one with the gift be a good servant to this creator of yours, to the hope of life, if they could act only for selfish needs? Giving someone pain as the sisters do doesn't prove anything except that the victim does not die. Wouldn't serving the light of life and loving life require that the person prove instead that of their own free will? They would choose right, choose that light of life and love for all people? Dear creator, she whispered, have we had it wrong all this time? Her hand covered her mouth a moment. And we thought we were bringing the Creator's light to these boys. Sister Verna's back straightened with resolve. She stood before Warren, putting her hands to the sides of his Radahan. As she stood with her eyes closed, her hands to the collar, there was a humming vibration in the air. After a moment, silence settled over the room, and then Richard heard a snapping sound. The Radahan cracked and fell away. Warren looked positively giddy at the sight of the broken collar. Richard wished it could be that easy for him. What are you going to do now, Warren? Richard asked. Are you going to leave the palace? Maybe, but I wish to study the book some more first, if the sisters will allow it. They will allow it, Sister Verna said. I will see to it. Then maybe I would like to travel to Aidendril to the wizard's keep and study the books and prophecies you told me were kept there. That sounds a wise plan, Warren. Sister, I must be going. Warren, she said, why don't you come along until I reach the valley? You are free now. She glanced to the balcony. I think it would do you good to get away from here for a time and think of other things. And I could use some help when we reach the valley, if Richard accomplishes what he thinks he will. Really? I would like that. As the three of them lugged their gear toward the stables, three guards, Kevin, Walsh, and Bolasdun, spotted them and ran to catch up. We may have found them, Richard, Kevin said. May have. What do you mean? Where are they? Well, last night the Lady Sifa set sail. We talked to people down at the docks who said they saw some women. Maybe the sisters go aboard. Most agree they saw six women go aboard in the darkness just before she sailed. Sailed? Richard groaned. What's the Lady Sifa? A ship, a big ship. They left with the tide late in the night. They have a good lead, and from what I hear, there isn't a ship in port that can catch the Lady Sifa or go as far to sea. We can't go after them and do your other task, Sister Verna said. Richard shifted his pack in annoyance. You're right. If it's really them, they're gone for now. But I know where they're going. We'll have to deal with them later. At least the Palace of the Prophets is safe. We have more important things to tend to right now. Let's get the horses and be on our way. Chapter 67 Kalin ran down the dark stone corridors and through the tomb-like chambers. The first rays of light splashed golden patches against the coarse, dark gray granite wall opposite the windows as she raced up an east stairway. Her heart pounded with the effort. She had not stopped running since Jebra had told her that she had spied a light in the wizard's keep. 
that Zed was back. She remembered what it felt like to run with long hair, the weight of it, the way it streamed out behind, flowing with her strides. She felt none of that now, but it didn't matter. She felt only desperate elation that Zed was back. She had been waiting so long. She screamed his name as she ran. Bursting into the cluttered reading room, she stumbled to a panting halt. Zed stood behind a table with books and papers scattered over it, just as she remembered it from the last time she had seen it, months ago. Candles on stands gave the small room an intimate glow. The reading room had but a single window facing the still, murky western sky. A big man with bushy eyebrows, mostly gray hair, and a weathered, creased face looked up from a walking stick he was inspecting. Addie sat in a chair to the side, her head flitting toward sounds. Zed cocked his head with a curious frown. Zed! She gulped air. Oh, Zed, I'm so relieved to see you. Zed! He turned toward the big man. Zed? The big man gave a nod. But I like Reuben. Zed, I need your help. Who'll be there? Addie said from the chair. Addie, it's me, Kalen. Kalen. She twitched her head toward Zed. Who'll be Kalen? Zed shrugged. A pretty girl with short hair. She seems to know us. What are you talking about? Zed, I need help. Richard is in trouble. I need you. Zed's brow wrinkled in bewilderment. Richard. I know that name. I think. Kalen was frantic. Zed, what's the matter? Don't you know me? Please, Zed, I need you. Richard needs you. Richard. He rubbed his smooth chin as he stared in thought at the table. Richard. Your grandson. Dear spirits, don't you know your own grandson? He stared at the table, thinking. Grandson, I seem to remember... No, can't say I do. Zed, listen to me. The Sisters of the Light have him. They've taken him away. Kalen stood silently, catching her breath. Zed's hazel eyes rose slowly to meet her gaze. His face lost its curiosity as his eyebrows drew in to hood his glare. The sisters of the light have Richard. Kalen had seen wizards angry, but she had never seen a look in any wizard's eyes like the look in Zed's eyes. Yes, she said. She wiped her sweaty palms on her hips as she watched a crack run up the stone of the wall behind him. They came and took him. Zed put his knuckles to the table and leaned toward her. That's not possible. They couldn't take him unless they got one of their cursed collars around his neck. Richard would not put a collar around his neck. Kalen's knees were beginning to tremble. He did. His seething expression seemed it might ignite the very air. Why would he put their collar around his neck, confessor? Because, she said in a small voice. I made him put it on. The candles on one of the stands close to him abruptly melted, dripping their wax to hissing puddles on the floor. The iron arms that had held the candles drooped down like a plant needing water. The big man shrank back toward the wall of shelves. Zed's voice came in a dangerous whisper. You did what, confessor? The room echoed with silence as she stood quivering. He didn't want to. I had to do it. I told him that he had to put it on to prove he loved me. Kaylin thought she felt herself hit the wall. She couldn't understand why she was sprawled on the floor. She pushed herself up with shaking arms. She gasped as she was suddenly jerked to her feet and slammed against the wall again. Zed, his eyes wild, was right in front of her. You did that to Richard! Kaylin's head spun. Her own voice sounded distant. You don't understand. I had to. Zed, I need your help. Richard told me to find you and tell you what I had done. Please, Zed, help him. In a rage, Zed backhanded her across the face. She skinned her hands on the stone floor as she went down. He yanked her to her feet and slammed her to the wall once more. I can't help him. No one can, you fool. Tears ran down her face. Why? Zed, we have to help him. She brought up her hands in front of her face to ward him off when he drew his hand back again. It didn't help. Her head smacked the wall again. The room spun. She shook all over. She had never seen a wizard in a rage so out of control. Kalen knew he was going to kill her for what she had done to Richard. You fool. You treacherous fool. No one can help him now. Please, Zed, you can. Please help him. Not even I. No one can get to him. I can't pass the towers. Richard is lost to us. 
All I had left is lost. What do you mean lost to us? With trembling fingers, she wiped blood from the corner of her mouth. She didn't wipe the tears. He will be back. He has to come back. Zed's eyes never left hers as he slowly shook his head. Not while any of us are alive. The Palace of the Prophets is in a spell of time. Richard will be there for the next 300 years while I train him. We will never see him again. He is lost to this world. Kaylin shook her head. No, dear spirits, no. That can't be. We will see him. It can't be true. True, Mother Confessor. You have put him beyond any help. I will never again see my grandson. You will never again see him. Richard will not return to this world for another 300 years because of you. Because you made him put on that collar to prove he loves you. He turned his back to her. Kaylin fell to her knees. No! She beat her fists on the floor. Dear spirits, why have you done this to me? She cried in choking sobs. Richard, my Richard! What happened to your hair, Mother Confessor? Zed asked in a menacing voice, his back still to her. Kaylin sat back on her heels. What did it matter anymore? The council convicted me of treason. I have been sentenced to be executed, to be beheaded. The people all cheered at the pronouncement of sentence. They all wanted to see it done, but I escaped. Zed nodded. The people shall have their wish. He grabbed what was left of her hair in his fist and started dragging her from the room. For what you have done, you shall be beheaded. Zed, she screamed. Zed, please don't do this. He used magic to drag her down the hall like a sack of feathers. Tomorrow at the winter solstice festival, the people shall have their wish. They shall see the mother confessor beheaded. As first wizard, I will see to it. I shall see it done. Kaylin went limp. What did it matter? The good spirits had abandoned her. They had stripped her of everything that mattered. Worse, she herself had condemned Richard to 300 years of the thing he feared most. She wanted to die. Death couldn't come fast enough for her. Richard stood with his hands on his hips as he watched the dark clouds made by spells in the distance in the Valley of the Lost. They looked beautiful in the sunrise, with golden edges and striations of glowing rays, but he knew they were deadly. Du Shai Lu put an affectionate hand to his arm. My husband makes me proud this day. He returns our land to us as the old words have foretold. I've explained it to you a dozen times, Du Shai Lu. I am not your husband. You have simply misinterpreted the old words. It only means we must do this together, and we haven't done it yet. I wish you would have come with me without bringing everyone else. I don't even know if this will work. We could be killed. She patted his arm reassuringly. The Kaharin has come. He can do anything. He will return our land. She left him to his thoughts and started back to the camp. All our people should be with us. It is their right. She stopped and turned back. Will we be leaving soon, Kaharin? Soon, Richard said absently. She started off again. I will be with our people when you are ready for me. The entire Baka Banmana nation was camped behind them. Thousands upon thousands of tents were spread out over the hills like mushrooms after a month of rain. He hadn't been able to talk them out of coming, to convince them to wait, so they were all here with him. Richard sighed. What difference did it make? If he was wrong and this failed, he had no reason to worry about all the Bakaban Mana being disappointed in him. He would be dead. Warren and Sister Verna quietly came up behind. Richard, Warren said, can we talk to you? Richard continued to stare out at the storms. Of course, Warren. He cast a glance back. What's on your mind? Warren pushed his hands up the opposite sleeves of his robes. Richard thought it made him look very wizard-like when he did that. Warren was going to someday end up being Richard's idea of what a wizard ought to be. Wise, compassionate, and charged with knowledge Richard could only wonder at. If they didn't all die, that was. Well, Sister Verna and I were talking about what happens after you get through the valley. Richard, I know what you want to do, but we have run out of time. There never was enough time to begin with. Tomorrow is winter solstice. It can't be done. Just because you don't know how to do something, that does not mean it can't be done. I don't understand. Richard smiled at them. You will. You will understand in a few hours. Warren looked away toward the valley. He idly scratched his nose. If you say so, Richard. Sister Verna said nothing. 
Richard was still trying to get used to her not arguing with him whenever he said something oblique. He wasn't sure she didn't want to. Warren, about the prophecy, the one about the gateway and the winter solstice, are you sure it's about this winter solstice? Warren nodded. And if there were an agent with an open box of Orden and the scrin bone, are those the only elements needed to open the gateway to tear the veil? A hot breeze ruffled Warren's hair. Yes. But you told me Dark and Rahl is dead. There is no agent. It sounded more like a worried question than a statement. Must the agent be alive? Sister Verna asked. Warren shifted his weight to the other foot. Well, not in principle, I guess. If he were somehow called back into this world, but I don't see how that could be done. But if it were done, that would be all that was needed. Richard sighed in frustration. And then this spirit agent could do the things the living agent would have done? Suspicion crept onto Warren's face. Well, yes and no. It would require another element. A spirit cannot perform the physical requirements necessary to complete the covenant. He would need a coadjutor. You mean the spirit could not perform certain of the tasks needed, so he would need hands that would work in this world? Yes. With a helper, a spirit could do what was needed. But how could an agent be called back into this world? I don't see how that could be accomplished. Sister Verna glanced away. You had better tell him. Richard pulled his shirt up and showed Warren the scar. Dark and Rahl burned me with his hand when I unintentionally called him back into this world. He said he was here to tear the veil. Warren's eyes opened wide. His worried gaze darted to the sister and then back to Richard. If Dark and Rahl is an agent, as you said, and he has someone to help him, then we are only one element away from destruction, the scrin bone. We need to know. Richard pushed the Mriswith cape back over his shoulder. Sister Verna, would you help me? What is it you would like me to do? The first time you told me how to try to touch my Han, I decided to concentrate on a mental image of my sword. But that time, the first time I used a background to put against it, it was something from the Book of Magic I told you about, the Book of Counted Shadows. When I tried to touch my Han with the sword on that background, something happened. I was somehow in Dahara, in the people's palace where the boxes are. I saw Dark and Rahl. He saw me, too, and spoke to me. He told me he was waiting for me. Sister Verna's eyebrows lifted. Did this ever happen again? No. It frightened the wits out of me. I never used that background again. I think if I use that background now, I may be able to see what is happening there. She folded her hands together before herself. I've never heard of such a thing. But it may have something to do with the magic of Orden. It would not be the first thing about you that astonished me. It could be real or just a fear, like a dream. I need to try. Would you sit with me? I'm afraid of not being able to pull back. Of course, Richard. She sat down on the ground and held up a hand. Come, I will be with you. Richard pulled the Mriswith cape around himself as he sat down, folding his legs. This thing hides my Han. Maybe it will work to keep Dark and Rahl from seeing me this time. Richard relaxed himself as he held hands with Sister Verna. He concentrated on the mental image of the sword against the black square with a white border, as he had done the first time. As he concentrated, seeking the calm center, something began to happen. The sword, the black square, and the white border all began to shimmer as if seen through heat waves, the same as the first time. The solid form of the sword softened, becoming transparent, and then vanished. The background dissolved. Once again, Richard was looking into the Garden of Life at the People's Palace. He searched the filmy image, seeing white bones where before he had seen burned bodies. He remembered them lying over the short walls in bushes and sprawled on the grass. They were much as he remembered, only now they were mostly exposed bones. Richard saw the white glowing figure of Dark and Rahl, but he was not standing before the stone altar, before the three boxes of Orden. He was near the circle that held white sand. The sand had not been there the last time he had seen this vision. A woman in a long brown skirt and white blouse knelt at Dark and Rahl's feet, bent over the circle of sand. Richard willed himself closer. She was drawing lines in the sparkling sorcerer's sand. Richard remembered some of the symbols she was drawing. Dark and Rahl had drawn them before, when he had opened the box. Richard watched her hand moving slowly, carefully, as she drew the lines of spells. Her right hand, he noticed, was missing the little finger. In the center of the circle, in the center of the sorcerer's sand, sat a round object. Richard went closer. 
It was carved all over with beasts, just as the prelate had described. Richard wanted to scream with rage. Just then, Darken Rahl lifted his face and looked right into Richard's eyes. A smile slowly spread on his lips. Richard didn't know if Darken Rahl was really looking at him or not, but he didn't wait to find out. With desperate effort, he forced the image of the sword back into his mind like slamming a door, at the same time banishing the black and white background. With a gasp, Richard forced his eyes open. His chest heaved. Sister Verna's eyes came open too. Richard, are you all right? You've been at it an hour. I felt you trying to pull back, so I pulled with you. What happened? What did you see? An hour? Richard was still trying to catch his breath. I saw Dark and Rahl, and the Scrinbone. He had a woman there helping him draw spells in the sorcerer's sand. Warren leaned over Richard's shoulder. Maybe it was just a vision of a fear. It may not have been real. Warren could be right, Sister Verna said. She drew her lower lip through her teeth as she thought. What did the woman look like? Wavy shoulder-length brown hair, maybe about your size. She was bent over drawing in the sand, so I couldn't see her eyes. Richard pressed his fingers to his forehead as he thought. Her hand. She was missing the little finger on her right hand. Warren groaned. Sister Verna's eyes slid closed. What? What's the matter? Sister Odette, she said. That's Sister Odette. Warren nodded confirmation. She has been gone for close to six months. I thought she went to get a boy. Curse the spirits, Richard said under his breath. He sprang to his feet. Warren, run and get Du Shailu. Tell her we must leave right now. He ground his teeth in frustration. He had thought he had all the time he needed. Well, he still had enough time if he hurried. Du Shailu seemed in a trance as Richard pulled her forward by the hand. With the sword of truth in his other hand, Richard was in a world of his own too. His thundering rage was a match for the angry black clouds. The spells of magic circled them like a pack of dogs around a porcupine, angry and insistent, but holding their distance as they searched for an opening. Wisps of light emerged from the darkness and whirled around them, spiraling down to vanish into an aura that surrounded Du Shailu. She seemed to be absorbing the magic, as Sister Verna told him she had done before. Together, they were the completed link Warren had told him the old book said would contain the power and bring the towers down. Through the waves of heat and the boiling mist, Richard saw the first tower. He pulled Du Shailu onward toward the glistening black wall that disappeared into the darkness overhead. Dust and dirt lifted around them as they rushed toward the arched opening in the wall. Spells snatched at them, but their light was sucked to Du Shailu. Richard acted without thought, not knowing what drove him onward and not trying to stop it. If he was to succeed, if he was to save Kalin, he had to let those things within himself guide him. He had to hope that if he truly had the gift, it would react on instinct, as Nathan had told him, and do what was needed. Du Shai Lu seemed not to notice the sparkling black sand they stood on in the center of the tower. She seemed lost in a private spell of her own, in the power passed down to her from those who built the towers and took her people's land. So far, she had done her half of what was needed. She had protected him. Now Richard had to do his part. On impulse, holding her hand tight in his, he lifted the sword high in the other, pointing it straight up. He lost himself in the fury of the magic, letting it overwhelm him. He felt the heat of it in the calm center he had always sought. He let the rage fill the void. Lightning exploded from the sword, arcing up into the darkness overhead, jumping from one wall to the other, bathing them all in liquid light. The noise was deafening. Fire raced through the black stone until the whole of the tower glowed, the stone turning white in the heat of the luminous discharge. Richard felt as if the lightning were passing through him, too. It seared him with its power, erupting outward and up through the sword. Only his rage enabled him to endure the ferocity of the onrushing force coming from within. Flickering webs of lightning cascaded down the walls and across the black sand until everything was alive with it. The black sand turned white, as had the walls, and the world burned with pulsing fire and light. Abruptly, it ended. The lightning cut off, the fire winked out, and the roar of noise ceased, leaving silence ringing in his ears. The polished black stone of the tower was left a blinding white gloss. Du Shailu seemed still not to notice what was around her, and Richard pulled her onward to complete the task for which they both had been born. In the white tower, as he held the sword high, he expected the flash of heat and light again, but it did not come. 
Instead, the counter to it, the balance to it, exploded forth. Concussion ripped the air, threatening to strip flesh from bone as black lightning blasted upward, a void in the light. Like the lightning before, Richard felt the might of the power erupting from deep within himself, as if his very soul were pouring it forth. The snaking void in the light raked the walls, and with a thunderous roar pierced a void into the darkness above. As the black lightning twisted into the darkness overhead, shadows oozed down the white walls, making it seem as if they were melting into the depths of eternal night. Darkness reached the ground and flowed toward them, soaking into the white sand, turning it black. Richard never gave thought to trying to escape the encroaching night. When it reached them, he felt as if they were being plunged into icy water. Du Shailu, her eyes closed, shivered with the touch of it. Richard noted it, but through the wrath of the sword's magic, it was a distant sensation that only fed the anger. It seemed the whole world had vanished forever into inky obscurity. Light and vision were beyond even memory. Richard felt the undulating, twisting rope of the black lightning, the void in the world of life, cut off. Sudden silence replaced the cacophony. He could hear himself breathing hard. He could hear Du Shailu doing the same. Light and life and warmth emerged from the cold void. Outside, through the arches in the stone, now glossy black where it was once white, Richard could see light coming through the thinning fog. The ground that before was baked and barren was now green and lush. Still holding hands, he and Du Shailu stood in the archway, watching the haze and smoke lift on a world no one had seen in thousands of years. Hand in hand, they walked out into the cool air across the thick grass and through shafts of sunlight. The storms of spells were gone, the dark clouds they spawned evaporating as they lifted. The air smelled fresh and clean, the feel of life vibrated around them. The valley off to the pale blue line of mountains in the distance was lush and green. Groves of trees were gathered in places along meandering streams. Gentle rises overlaid each other in differing shades of green. Richard could understand why the Bakaban Mana would want their land back. It was a place that simply looked like home. This was a place of light and hope that would have stayed in a people's heart throughout all the dark centuries. It was not a place that belonged to them. It was they that belonged to this place. You have done it, Kaharin, Du Shailu said. You have returned our home from beyond the mist. Richard saw a few people scattered about in the distance, those who had been trapped in spells for untold years. They wandered aimless and confused. He had to find two he knew. Sister Verna and Warren galloped toward them, bringing his horse. Before they had completely stopped, Richard was up on Bonnie. Du Shailu thrust a hand up. She wanted to go with him. Reluctantly, he pulled her up behind. Richard, Warren said. That was astonishing. How did you do it? I haven't the slightest idea, Warren. I had been hoping you could explain it to me. Richard galloped Bonnie off in the direction he remembered seeing Chase and Rachel when he had been through the valley the first time. Warren and Sister Verna followed after. It wasn't long before he found them sitting on the bank of a brook. Chase, with his arm around Rachel's shoulders, and his usual look of strained tolerance nowhere in evidence, looked confused. Richard swung his leg over Bonnie's neck and leapt down. Chase, are you all right? Richard, what's going on? Where are we? We were coming to get you. You can't go... He looked around. You can't go into the valley. Zed needs you. The veil is torn. I know. Richard handed the reins to Sister Verna and quickly introduced everyone. My friends will explain it all to you. He put a knee to the ground in front of Rachel. The dark, amber-colored stone of tears hung on a chain around her neck just as he remembered it. Rachel, are you all right? How do you feel? She blinked up at him. I was in a nice place, Richard. This is a nice place, too. You will be fine now. Rachel, did Zed give you that stone? She nodded. He said you might want it, and I was to keep it for you until you came to get it. That's why I'm here, Rachel. May I have it then? She smiled and pulled it over her head. Richard unclasped the chain and pulled the stone off. Holding it in his hand, he could feel its warmth and Zed's presence. The chain was too small for him. He handed it back to Rachel, telling her it looked prettier on her than it would on him and then strung the stone onto a leather thong he had ready. He hung the Stone of Tears around his neck, along with the Aegeal and the dragon's tooth. From the corner of his eye, he watched the distant dot growing in the sky. Richard, Warren said, 
After seeing what I just saw with the towers, I have no doubt you can do what you say you can do. But you have no time to reach where you must go. Tomorrow the world is going to end if you don't get there. What are you going to do? Where is it we are going, my husband? Du Shailu asked. We are not going anywhere, Du Shailu. You are staying here with your people. Husband, Chase said, a scowl finally starting to creep onto his face. I am not her husband. It's just some silly idea she got in her head. Richard watched the red shape growing high up in the sky. Look, I don't have time to explain it. Sister Verna and Warren can tell you about it. Sister Verna, a suspicious frown on her face, took a step toward him. What are you going to do? Warren was right. You have no time. In the distance, the red wings spread wide as the dragon plunged into a dive. Richard unhooked his pack from Bonnie, slinging it onto his back. He gave Bonnie's neck a goodbye hug. He hooked on the quiver and slipped the bow over his shoulder. From the corner of his eye, he watched the dragon plummet straight down. I'm going to have time. I must leave you now, sister. What do you mean you are leaving? How? At the last instant, the dragon pulled out of the dive. Her long neck stretched out. Wings spread wide, she shot toward them at incredible speed, skimming along just above the ground. I have only one chance to reach my goal in time. I must fly. Fly, Warren and Sister Verna shouted together. Scarlet swept up with a roar. Everyone else saw her for the first time. Immense wings beat to slow the dragon's speed. Their clothes flapped in the sudden burst of wind. The grass all around flattened in the gusts. Warren, Sister Verna, and Du Shailu stepped back in surprise. Scarlet settled to the ground as her forward speed was brought to a halt by her beating wings. Richard, Sister Verna said, as she slowly shook her head, you have the oddest pets of anyone I've ever met. Red dragons are pets to no one, sister. Scarlet is a dear friend. Richard trotted toward the huge red dragon glistening in the sunlight. Scarlet snorted a small cloud of gray smoke. Richard, how good to see you again. Since you called me so urgently with my tooth, I presume you are in trouble again, as usual. Trouble indeed, my friend. Richard patted a glossy red scale. I've missed you, Scarlet. Well, I've already eaten. I guess I must instead give you a ride in the sky to work up an appetite. Then I will eat you. Richard laughed. Where is your little one? Her ears twitched. Off hunting. Gregory is not so little anymore. He misses you and would like to see you. I would like to see Gregory too. But I'm in a terrible hurry right now. I'm running out of time. Richard! Du Shailu ran toward him. I must go too. I must go where my husband goes. Richard leaned toward Scarlet's ear as she lowered her head and peered at him with one yellow eye. A little flame, Scarlet, he whispered, just for effect. Don't hurt her. Du Shailu leapt back with a squeal as a burst of fire charred the grass at her feet. Du Shailu, your land is returned to your people. You must stay with them. You are their spirit woman. They need you. They need your guidance. I would ask something else of you. Protect the towers that are on your land. I don't know if they can bring any harm, but as the Kaharan, I order that no one shall ever enter them. Guard them, and keep all others out too. Live in peace with others who would live in peace with you, but continue to practice with the blades, so you may protect yourselves. Du Shailu drew herself up tall. The little strips of cloth on her prayer dress fluttered in the breeze, along with her thick black hair. You are wise, Kaharan. I will see that it is as you say, until you return to your wife and your people. Richard, Sister Verna said, her face held a serious look. Do you know where Kaelin is? Aiden Drill. She would have gone there. The prophecy takes place before her people. She will be in Aiden Drill. The time of choosing is upon you, Richard. Where are you going now? He looked long into her steady gaze. Dahara. After appraising him silently for a moment, she at last embraced him in a warm hug. She kissed his cheek. And then? Richard raked his fingers through his thick hair. Somehow I will stop what is to happen in Dahara, and then I must get to Aidendril before it's too late. Take care, my friend. She nodded. Warren and I will see to the people here who have been released from the spells. They will need guidance. I have been a sister of the light for nearly 200 years. All I ever wanted was to help people who needed it. But you had help. There is no excuse for taking you or others. I want to try to set some of this right. Warren gave Richard a firm hug. Thanks, Richard, for everything. I look forward to seeing you again. Richard winked. Try not to have any adventures. I'll go with you, Chase said. No. Richard wiped a hand over his face. 
No, go home, Chase. Take Rachel to her new mother and her brothers and sisters. Emma will be worried sick by now. She hasn't seen you in ages. Go home to your wife and family. I'll need to be returning home soon, too. Richard turned back to Sister Verna. We must do something about those six sisters. They're sailing for Westland. The people there have no protection against magic. In Westland, those sisters will be like hawks in a hatchery. I think that journey will take them some time. You have time enough for them, Richard. Good. Kaylin will want to wed before the mud people. Then I may need to come and get some advice on how to handle those six. Talk to Nathan and Anne. We can decide what to do then. Be careful, Warren said. He stood stoically with his hands in the opposite sleeves of his robes. And I don't just mean with yourself. Don't forget the things Nathan and I have told you. Don't forget that everyone else is in danger from what you can do with the Stone of Tears. I don't think you have yet reached your time of choosing. I'll do my best. Scarlet lowered herself so he could climb up onto her shoulders. He gripped the black-tipped spines and hauled himself up. Richard gave a slap to a red scale. To Dahara, my friend. Again. With a roar of flame, Scarlet launched into the sky. Chapter 68 In the distance, in the pre-dawn gloom, he could see the green glow. It rose from the people's palace through the glass roof of the Garden of Life like a beacon. Richard had seen that color of green from only one place, the underworld. The icy wind tore at his clothes as Scarlet's wings beat with a steady cadence. She had put strenuous effort into the flight to Dahara. She understood the danger posed by the Keeper. The underworld would take her too, and she hated Dark and Rao. He had stolen her egg before and used it to enslave her. As she began her descent, she peered back, her ears turning toward him. There will be enough time, Richard. We can still make it to Aiden Drill. It is only just dawn. I know you'll get me there, Scarlet. I'll try not to give you too much time to rest. Scarlet banked to the left, steepening their descent down toward the courtyard where they had been before. It was a place the huge dragon could land in the dark with room to spare. The palace's vast jumble of roofs and walls rushed up toward them with frightening speed. Richard's toes tingled with the feeling of floating off her back as she plummeted. Suddenly, from the darkness below, a blinding flash of lightning crackled up all about them. It left yellow lines of afterimage in his vision. Before Richard could make sense of it, another came. Scarlet roared in pain and pitched to the left. They dropped into a sickening spiral toward the ground. Richard gripped her spines as the huge dragon tried to recover. On the vast steps rotating below, he saw the woman illuminated by the light of the next bolt of lightning she sent forth from her hands. Once again, Scarlet roared in pain. He couldn't see the woman in the darkness when the lightning cut off. Scarlet struggled to check the uncontrolled descent. Richard knew that another bolt of lightning would finish her. He tore the bow from his back and yanked an arrow from the quiver. Scarlet, make fire so I can see her. As Richard drew the string to his cheek, Scarlet let out a fiery roar of pain and anger. In its red glow, he saw the woman raise her arms again. Before he could call the target, the spiral took her out of his line of sight. Scarlet, look out! Scarlet drew back her right wing and they tipped the other way. The yellow lightning streaked past to the left, just missing them. The ground was coming up fast. In the flickering red light of the dragon's blast of fire, Richard saw her raise her hands again. He drew the bowstring and twisted his body with their motion to keep her in sight. Before she could disappear again, he called the target. The instant it came to him, the arrow was away. Turn! Scarlet beat her right wing, making them wobble in the air as the yellow bolt erupted past between the dragon's neck and wing. Almost before it began, the lightning cut off. A ripple of total blackness passed over them. The arrow had found its mark. The keeper now had Sister Odette. With a hard jolt, they hit the ground. Richard was thrown off and tumbled across the ground. He sat up and shook his head, then sprang to his feet. Scarlet, are you hurt bad? Are you alive? Go, she groaned in a deep, vibrating voice. Hurry, get him before he has us all. She held her trembling left wing out. Richard stroked her snout. I'll be back. Hang on. Richard drew the sword as he charged up the hill of steps. He didn't need to call forth the anger. It was with him before he had even touched the hilt. He ran in a blind rage toward the doors between the colossal columns. As he ran through the doors, a handful of soldiers charged out of the darkness. Without pause, Richard scythed into them. His blade flashed in the torchlight coming from the vast halls inside. 
Richard danced with the spirits. His blade was fluid grace among the hacking soldiers. The first he cut in half, breastplate and all. Every charge was met with swift steel. In a matter of moments, the 15 men lay scattered across the bloody floor, and then Richard was moving again. So much for his welcome back. He remembered the Daharan army pledging their loyalty to him the last time he had been here, when he had killed Dark and Rahl. Maybe they just didn't know who he was. More likely, they knew precisely who he was. Richard chose a hall that led in the direction of the Garden of Life. Three levels of balconies looked down on the hall. Most of the torches were dark. He saw no people as he ran past a devotion square with white sand raked in circles around a pitted rock. From a staircase at the side, a half-dozen moored Sith charged down, running toward him. Each wore her red leather uniform, and each had an Aegeal in her hand. Through the rage, he realized that he couldn't use the sword on them, or they would capture him by its magic. He was furious. He needed to get to Dark and Rahl. He didn't need to have to deal with these deadly women. Reluctantly, Richard sheathed his sword and drew his knife. Denna had told him once that if he had just used his knife instead of his sword, he would have had her. He was not going to be able to outrun them. He was going to have to kill them. The biggest, a blonde-headed woman at the lead, held her hands out as he went for her. Lord Rahl, no! The other five slid to a stop behind her. Richard slashed at her, but she lurched back into a half-crouch with her hands held out to the sides. Lord Rahl, stop! We are here to help you! Though he had put the sword away, he had no shortage of rage of his own. He had to get to Dark and Rahl if he was to get to Kalen. Help me in the afterlife. You will be there shortly. No, Lord Rahl, I am Kara. We are here to help you. You cannot go that way. That hall is not secure. Richard stood panting, knife in hand. I don't believe you. You want to capture me. I know very well what Mord Sith do to their captives. I knew Dena, your mistress. You wear her Aegeal. Mord Sith do not live to hurt their captives any longer. You set us free. We would never hurt the one who set us free. We revere you. When I left here, I told the soldiers to burn all those outfits and give you new clothes. I ordered the Aegeal taken from you. If you revere me, why have you not followed my orders? A sly smile touched her lips as she lifted an eyebrow over a cold blue eye. Because you cannot free us just to enslave us in a life you choose. We are free to choose for ourselves. You made that possible. We chose to fight to protect our Lord Rahl. We have sworn to lay down our lives for you if necessary. Not only the men of the first file can protect you. We have chosen to be your personal bodyguards. Not even the first file dared argue with us. We take orders from no one but Lord Rahl. Then I order you to leave me alone. I'm sorry, Lord Rahl, but we cannot follow that order. Richard didn't know what to believe. This could just be a trap. I'm here to stop Dark and Rahl. I have to get to the Garden of Life. If you don't get out of my way, I will have to kill you. We know where you go, Kara said. We will take you. But you must not go that way. We do not hold all the palace. That way is not safe. In fact, this whole section of the palace is in the hands of the insurgents. The first file would have lost a thousand men to come down here. We told them we would go, that it would be less risk to you. For that reason only, they agreed. Richard started angling around the women. I don't believe you, and I can't risk what you would do if you were lying. This is too important. If you try to stop me, I will have to kill you. If you go that way, Lord Rahl, you will die. Please, let me whisper a secret message in your ear. Kara handed her Aegeal to a woman behind her. You may hold your knife to me. I am without a weapon. Richard gripped her hair in one fist and held the razor-sharp knife to her throat. If she so much as flinched, he intended to cut her throat. Kara put her mouth close to his ear. We are here to help you, Lord Rahl, she whispered. It is the toasted toad's truth. Richard straightened. Where did you hear such a thing? Do you know its meaning? Commander General Tremac said that it is a coded message from First Wizard Zorander, so that you would know we are loyal to you. He told me to tell no one but you. Who is General Tremac? The Commander General First File of the Palace Guard. They are loyal to you. The First File is the ring of steel around the Lord Rahl. Wizard Zorander told General Tremac to guard the Garden of Life at all cost. Two days ago, that magic woman came. She killed nearly 300 of our men getting into the Garden of Life. We tried to stop her, but we could not. We have no magic against her. She killed close to a 100 on her way out tonight. We followed her out and watched from a window on the third level. We saw her send lightning to strike your dragon from the sky. We saw you kill her. 
Only the true Lord Rao could do that. Please, Lord Rao, terrible things are happening in the Garden of Life. Let us take you there, so you may stop the evil spirit. Richard had no time to waste. They had to have gotten that message from Zed. He had to trust them. All right, let's go, but I'm in a hurry. Grins came to each woman. Kara took back her Aegeal and grabbed him by the shirt at one shoulder. Another of the Mord Sith gripped his shirt at the other shoulder. They started running, dragging him along with them. Kara whispered that he should be as quiet as possible. The other four spread out in front, scouting the way. They took him quickly, but silently, through small side halls and dark rooms. While the scouts slipped up narrow servant stairs, Kara and the other pressed him up against the wall, crossing their lips with a finger, waiting until they heard a short whistle, then dashed up the stairs, pulling him along by his shirt. At the top of the stairs, he nearly tripped over the body of one of the four moored Sith who had gone ahead. Her face had been split open by a sword. Eight Daharan men in armor were sprawled in contorted positions down the hall, blood running from their ears. Richard recognized death caused by an Aegeal. One of the women in red leather at the end of the hall motioned them onward. Kara pulled him around a corner where the woman pointed and up another staircase. He felt like a sack of laundry the way they yanked him this way and that, jamming him up against walls and in corners while others scouted a clear course. He could hardly keep up with them as they ran down halls, still gripping his shirt at each shoulder, hauling him along. Richard lost track of where they were going as they went upstairs and through countless rooms. A few of the rooms had windows, and he could see that the sun was coming up. Richard was winded when he finally recognized the broad corridor they entered. Hundreds of men in uniform of mail and shiny breastplates all dropped to a knee when they saw him. The clatter of all their armor and weapons echoed down the wide hall. Every man put a fist over his heart. When they came up, one stepped forward. Lord Rall, I am Commander General Trimac. We are close to the Garden of Life. I will lead you there. I know where it is. Lord Rall, you must hurry. The rebel generals have launched an attack. I don't know if we will be able to hold this position long, but we will hold it to the last man while you are beyond. Thank you, General. Just hold them off until I send that bastard Dark and Rall back to the underworld. The General gave a salute of his fist to his heart as Richard started moving. He trotted down a polished granite hall, he remembered. It took him to the huge gold-covered doors to the Garden of Life. Nearly in a trance of rage, Richard burst through the doors into the garden. The sun was up. Its first rays lit the treetops in the garden. Richard marched down the path, past the short, vine-covered walls, and out onto the grass. In the center of the garden was a circle of white sand, sorcerer's sand. The round scrin bone sat in the center, with complicated lines drawn in the sand that encircled it. Beyond was the altar with the three boxes of Orden, the gateway to another world. Each was beyond black, seeming as if it would suck the light from the room. From the opened box, a shaft of green light poured forth, up through the glass roof and into the sky. Whatever Dark and Rahl had been doing was opening the gateway. Sparkling light, blue, yellow, and red spiraled around the shaft of green light. The white, glowing form of Dark and Rahl watched him stride across the grass. Richard stopped before the circle of sorcerer's sand opposite him. A small smile spread on Dark and Rahl's lips. Welcome, my son came the hiss of his voice. Richard felt the scar of the handprint heat on his chest. He ignored the pain of it. Dark and Rahl's glowing blue eyes moved to the stone of tears hanging from Richard's neck. Dark and Rahl's gaze locked on Richard's. I have spawned a great wizard. We would like you to join with us, Richard. Richard said nothing. He seethed with wrath as he watched Dark and Rahl's smile widen. Through the fury of anger, the pounding wrath of magic, he watched, and he sought the calm center, too. We can offer you what no other can, Richard, what the Creator himself cannot offer. We are greater than the Creator. We would like you to join with us. What could you possibly offer me? Dark and Rawl spread his glowing arms. Immortality. Richard was too angry to laugh. When did you succumb to the delusion that I would believe anything you would have to say? It is true, Richard, he whispered. We have the power to grant it. Just because you managed to get some of the sisters to believe your lies, that does not mean I would. We are the keeper of the underworld. We control life and death. We have the power to grant either, especially to one of your magic. You can be the master of the world of life, 
as I would have been before you interfered. Not interested. Got anything better to offer? Darken Rawl's cruel smile widened. His eyebrows lifted. Oh, yes, my son, he hissed. Oh, yes. He swept his hand out over the circle of sand. Shimmering light formed into a person kneeling forward. The light coalesced into a recognizable form. Kalen. She was in her white confessor's dress, kneeling forward. Her hair was cut short, just as in the vision he had had in the tower. A tear fell from her closed eyes as the side of her face pressed to the block. She mouthed his name and that she loved him. Richard's heart pounded violently. The dragon is wounded, Richard. She cannot take you to Aidendrill. Your time has run out. You have no option left but to let us help you. What do you mean, help? Raoul's smile returned. I told you we have the power over life and death. Without our help this afternoon before her people, this is what will happen. His glowing hand swept out again. The blade's broad edge glinted in the air above her. The axe descended, thunking into the wooden block, sending out a spray of blood. Richard flinched. Kaylin's head tumbled away. Bright red blood spread beneath her, soaking into the sand, into the white dress as her body toppled to the side. No! Richard screamed, his fists at his sides. No! Dark and Rawl swept his hand over the body and it vanished into sparkling light and faded away. Just as I have taken away the vision of what will happen this day, we can stop the reality. We can offer immortality not only to you, but if you join with us to her too. Richard stood stunned. It sank in, really sank in for the first time. Scarlet was wounded. She could not fly him to Aidendrill. This was winter solstice. Kaylin was going to die this day, and he had no way of getting to her. His breath came in ragged gasps. The world was ending for him. This was the meaning of the prophecy. If he took this offer, if he chose to stop her death, then the world would end for everyone else. He thought of Chase taking Rachel home to meet her new mother. He thought of all the happiness she would have in that life with love around her. He thought of his own life with his father and mother, of the love, the happy times together, even the not-so-happy times, and how much it had meant to him. He thought about the time he had spent with Kaylin, and the joy of being in love with her and all the other people who must have had such joy and would in the future, if there was a future. You can walk hand in hand with her, Richard, forever. Richard's eyes came up from the white sand, hand in hand, through the ashes of death, forever. What would it do to Kaylin, to her love for him, if he offered her such a selfish destiny? She would be horrified. Then whenever she looked at him, she truly would see a monster, forever. He would live forever with her revulsion, not her love. Thus, in trying to save her, he would destroy not only everyone else, but her heart, too. The price was too high even for his love. But this would end his life, his love, too. Richard was consumed with rage and calm at the same time. He stared into the glowing eyes of evil. You would poison our love with your taint of hate. You don't even know the meaning of love. The wrath swelled to a wild storm within him. At least he would extract his price for this, his vengeance. Richard lifted the stone of tears in his fist. Dark and Rawl staggered back a step. Richard, think about what you are doing. You will pay for this. Richard pulled a handful of black sorcerer sand from his pocket and cast it onto the circle of white sand. Dark and Rawl threw his arms open. No, you fool! The white sand writhed as if alive, as if in pain. The symbols drawn in it twisted, contorting around themselves. The ground shook. Steaming fissures raced across the grassy ground. Lightning flared up from the sparkling white sand, flicking about the Garden of Life. The room thundered with a riot of noise and blinding light. The sorcerer's sand melted into a liquid pool of blue fire. The air shuddered with violent concussions. Dark and Rawl shook his fists to the sky. No! His head came down, and when he saw Richard coming slowly toward him, the stone of tears held out in his fist, he went still. His hand came up in forbidding. Richard staggered to a stop, the pain of the scar on his chest taking his breath. The agony seared through him. From deep within, he pulled resolve and made himself move despite the torment. Each step only increased the pain. It felt as if his flesh was burning off his bones and the marrow itself were boiling. 
In the calm at the center of the storm of anger, he was able to ignore it. Richard pulled the stone of tears off over his head. He held the leather thong out in his hands. The stone dangling before Darken Rahl's face. Rahl shrank back. You will wear this in the depths of death forever. Richard stepped closer. Kneel. The glowing form sank to its knees. The glowing eyes stayed on the stone in the air above. Richard lowered the leather thong to hang it over the head of his father's spirit. He paused. Over Darken Rahl's head behind him, he saw the altar that held the boxes. The open one in the center, alive with things beyond knowing, was sending its green light upward in a beacon. Richard remembered what Anne, Nathan, and Warren had told him. If he used the stone for selfish reasons, for hate, it would tear the veil. He wanted more than anything to send Dark and Rawl to the depths of the underworld, to punish him forever for what he had done. But that would only accomplish what he had already decided was beyond price. Besides, he had brought this on himself. That he had not done it intentionally made no difference. Life was not fair, it simply existed. If you accidentally stepped on a poisoned snake, you got bitten. Intentions were irrelevant. I have caused my own grief, Richard whispered. I must suffer the consequences of my own actions. I cannot make others pay for what I have caused, intentionally or not. Richard hung the stone of tears back around his own neck. Dark and Rahl came to his feet in alarm. Richard, you don't know what you're saying. Punish me. Hang the stone around my neck. Have your vengeance. Richard turned partway toward the center of the Garden of Life and held out his hand. The round scrin bone in the pool of blue fire hurtled to his palm. His magic protected him. He held the scrin bone up high. In the grip of rage and the grip of calm, he called the power onward. It erupted from his fist. Lightning, yellow and hot, shot forth into dark and raw. Lightning, black and cold, shot forth into dark and raw. They twisted together in the unleashed wrath of the scrin. A ripple of total darkness swept across the room, and when it lifted, the lightning and dark and raw were gone. The scrin bone felt cool in his fist. The green light from the box glowed brighter, making the room hum. Richard pulled the stone of tears from his neck. The leather thong fell away as the stone turned to black in his palm. Richard thrust out his hand. The stone of tears flew to the green light, floating in it a moment, rotating in the beam. The green light faded as the stone of tears sank toward the box, becoming transparent until it passed from existence. The beacon of green light vanished, plunging the garden of life into silence. Richard held the scrin bone out in his fist, and once again the twin lightning erupted, thundering across the distance. Flashes of white-hot light and ice-cold blackness washed over him. When it ended, and silence rang in his ears once more, the three boxes sat on the altar. Each was closed. Richard knew they could not be opened again without the book, and the book existed only in his head. The boxes of Orden and the gateway they represented would remain closed for all time. Richard heard a metallic snap. He felt something brush at his neck, felt something fall at his feet. He looked down to see the collar, the Radahan on the ground. It was off his neck. He was free of it. The pain, too, was gone. He felt his chest. The scar was gone. In the silence, Richard stood dazed. He wasn't sure what had just happened. He didn't know how he had done it. It was over. For him, everything was over. Kalen was going to die this day. And then he was running. The day wasn't over yet. As he emerged from the doors of the Garden of Life, the five moored Sith surrounded him. He ignored them as he ran. In the corridor beyond, a sweaty, dirty General Tremac waited with hundreds of men just as grimy looking. Many were bloody. With a cacophony of clanging armor and weapons, the men as far as he could see down the smoky corridor fell to their knees. Fists clapped to hearts. General Tremac returned to his feet. As he took three long strides toward Richard, Kara moved protectively in front of him. Get out of my way, woman. Kara didn't budge. No one touches Lord Rao. I'm his protection just as much as... Stop it, both of you. Kara relaxed and stepped to the side. General Tremac gripped Richard by the shoulders. Lord Rahl, you've done it. It took a long time, but you did it. Done what? What do you mean it took a long time? His eyebrows lifted. You've been in there most of the day. Richard's breath faltered. What? We fought them fiercely for hours, but we were being pushed back. We were outnumbered ten or fifteen to one. Then you sent the lightning. 
I've never seen anything like it. Wizard Zorander told me that the palace is a huge power spell drawn on the ground of the plateau, drawn to protect and give power to the Lord Raal. I never would have believed it until I saw it myself. The whole of the palace was alive with lightning. It flickered through every wall in the place. Every one of those bastard generals who was loyal to Dark and Raal was cut down by the lightning. Their troops who fought on were ripped apart by it too. Those who laid down their weapons and joined us were unharmed. Richard didn't know what to say. I'm glad, General, but I can't take credit. I was in there the whole time. I'm not even sure what I did in there, much less what happened out here. We are the steel against steel. You did your part. You were the Lord Raal, the magic against the magic. We are all proud of you. General Tremac gave Richard a clap on the shoulder. Whatever you did, you must have chosen right. Richard put his fingers to his forehead, trying to think. What time is it? Like I said, you were in there most of the day while we fought out here. It's near to late afternoon. Richard clutched at his chest. I have to go. He started running. Everyone charged off after him. Before long, he was confused by the huge converging halls. He slid to a stop on the slick marble floor and turned to Kara at his hip. Which way? To where, Lord Raal? Where I came in, the fastest way. Follow us, Lord Raal. Richard ran behind the five moored Sith. Behind him came what seemed to be the entire army of the palace. The racket of all the armor and boots echoed off the walls and ceilings high overhead. Columns, arches, staircases, devotion squares, and intersections of halls flew past. They raced down halls and down stairs. Richard was winded when nearly an hour later he went through the doors between the giant columns and out into the cold air. Soldiers poured out behind. He ran down the steps four at a time. Scarlet lay on her side in the snow, the glossy red scales rising and falling with her labored breathing. Scarlet, you're still alive. Richard rubbed her snout. I was so worried. Richard, I see you have managed to survive. It must not have been as difficult as you thought. She struggled to give a dragon's grin. It faded. I'm sorry, my friend, but I cannot fly. My wing is injured. I tried, but until it is healed, I'm afraid I'm stuck on the ground. Richard shed a tear on her snout. I understand, my friend. You got me here. You saved the world of life. You are a heroine more noble than any in history. Will you be all right? Will you be able to fly again? She managed a weak laugh. I will fly again, but not for a month or so. I will recover. It is not so bad as it seems. Richard turned to the officers behind. Scarlet is my friend. She has saved us all. I want you to bring her food. Whatever she needs until she is recovered. Protect her as you would me. Fists went to hearts. Richard grabbed the general's arm. I need a horse, a strong horse, right now, and I need to know how to get to Aiden Drill. The general turned. Get this strong horse now. You, go get maps to Aiden Drill for Lord Raal. Men started running. Richard turned back to the dragon. I'm so sorry you're suffering, Scarlet. Scarlet's chuckle rumbled deep in her throat. The injury is not so painful. Look over there, around the side. Her head, at the end of her long neck, followed him around. Richard was astonished to see an egg nestled in a crook of her tail. A big yellow eye peered at him. I just gave birth. That is most of my weakness. Just as well I'm to be aground. She played fire over the egg. Tenderly, she stroked her talons over it. As Richard watched, he thought about the beauty of life and how happy he was that others could continue to have it. But the vision of the falling axe kept playing over and over in his head. He couldn't stop the horror of it. His hands shook. It could be happening at that very moment. His breathing came in ragged pulls. At last, a man came running with a map. He held it out and pointed. Here, Lord Raal, is Aidendril. This is the fastest route, but it will still take you several weeks. Richard stuffed the map in his shirt as another soldier galloped up on the horse. Richard retrieved his pack and bow from the snow where they had fallen when Scarlet had come to ground. General Tremac held the reins to the muscular horse while Richard quickly lashed his things to the saddle. There is food in the saddlebags. When will you return, Lord Raal? Richard's mind was in a fog, racing in a thousand directions at once. All he could see was the axe falling. He leapt up into the saddle. I don't know when I can. Carry on until then. And continue to guard the Garden of Life. Don't let anyone go in there. 
Safe return, Lord Rao. Our hearts are with you. Fists went to chests as he urged the powerful horse into a gallop and charged at full speed through the huge gates that stood open for him. Chapter 69 Richard cursed under his breath when the horse dropped dead under him. He picked himself up when he had stopped rolling through the snow and started pulling his things off the lifeless, lathered beast. He felt an ache of sorrow for the horse. It had given him everything it had. He had lost count of how many horses had died under him. Some simply stumbled to a stop and refused to move anymore. Some dropped to a walk and would run no more. Some gave everything until their hearts quit. Richard had known he was being too hard on them and had tried to pace them, but he simply could not bring himself to go slow enough. When a horse died or quit running, he managed to find another. Some owners were reluctant to sell, thinking they would haggle with him. Richard threw a fistful of gold at them and took the horse. He was near dead with exhaustion himself. He had slept and eaten little. Sometimes he had walked while his mount recovered. When he had had to find a new horse, he had run. Page 685. Richard hoisted the pack onto his back and started trotting off. It had been two weeks since he had left Dahara. He knew he had to be close to Aidendrill. The fact that it was two weeks past winter solstice somehow didn't seem as important as his rush to reach Kalin. It somehow seemed to him that if he could hurry fast enough, it would save her. That if he put in his best effort, it would somehow make time wait for him. He could not accept that he was too late. He came to a panting halt at the top of a rise in the road. Ahead in the sparkling sunlight lay Aden Drill. On the wall of mountains to the far side of the city, he could see the gray walls of the wizard's keep. Richard ran on through the snow. The streets were crowded with people, people hurrying through the cold afternoon air and people standing about stomping their feet to keep warm as they hawked their wares. Richard rushed past them all. When he saw people were staring at him because of the Sword of Truth, he pulled the Mriswith cape over it. A hawker ahead stood by the side of the road with a short pole resting on the ground. It had a crossbar with wispy strips hanging from it. When Richard realized what the man was calling out, he came out of his mental fog with a jolt. Confessor's hair, the man bellowed. Get a look of the mother confessor's hair. Right off her vile head. Don't have many left. Show your children the hair of the last confessor. Richard's eyes locked on the long hair. It was Kalin's. He swept the lot of it off the pole and stuffed it in his shirt. When the man thought to fight for it, Richard slammed him up against the wall. He gripped the man's shirt in his fists and lifted him clear of the ground. Where did you get this? The... the council bought it from them to sell. Bought it fair after they caught it from her. It belongs to me, he shouted for help. Thief! Thief! When an angry crowd pressed in to defend the man, the sword came out. People scattered. The hawker ran for his life. Richard's fury was building despite his putting the sword away as he headed for the confessor's palace. He saw it rising up on the vast grounds ahead. He remembered Kalin telling him how magnificent it was. He knew it almost as if he had seen it before. He remembered, too, Kalin telling him about a woman there, a cook. No, the head cook. What was her name? Sand something. Sanderholt, that was it. Mr. Sanderholt. The aroma of cooking led him to the kitchen entrance. He charged through the door. A room full of working people shrank back at the sight of him. It was obvious that no one wanted any part of whatever he was about. Sanderholt, he called out. Mistress Sanderholt, where is she? People nervously pointed to a hallway. Before he had gone more than a dozen strides down the hall, a thin woman came rushing from the other direction. What's the trouble? Who's calling me? I am, Richard said. Her frown withered to a look of consternation. What is it I can do for you, young man? She said in an uneasy voice. Richard worked at keeping threat out of his tone. He didn't think he was very successful. Kalen, where can I find her? Her face turned nearly as white as her apron. You would be Richard. She told me of you. You look like she said. Yes, where is she? Mistress Sanderhold swallowed. I'm sorry, Richard, she whispered. The council sentenced her to death. The sentence was carried out at the winter solstice festival. Richard stood staring down at the thin woman. He was having difficulty deciding if they were talking about the same person. I think you misunderstood, he managed. I mean the mother confessor, Mother Confessor Kaylin Amnell. 
You must be talking about someone else. My Kalen can't be dead. I came as fast as I could. I swear I did. Her eyes were filling with tears. She tried to blink them away. She stared up at him. Slowly, she shook her head. She put a bandaged hand to his side. Come, Richard. You look as if you could use a meal. Let me get you a bowl of soup. Richard dropped his pack, bow, and quiver to the floor. The Central Council sentenced her to death. She gave a weak nod. She escaped but was caught. The Central Council reiterated the sentence before the people at the behead at the execution. And then the members of the Council all stood smiling while the people cheered them. Maybe she escaped again. She's a resourceful woman. I was there, she said in a broken voice, tears running down her face. Please, don't make me tell you what I saw. I've known Kaylin since she was born. I loved her. Maybe there was a way to go back somehow and get here in time. There had to be a way. He felt hot and dizzy. No, he was too late. Kaylin was dead. He had had to let her die to stop the keeper. The prophecy had beaten him. Richard gritted his teeth. Where is the council? At last, she managed to take her eyes from him. She pointed a bandaged hand down the hall and gave him directions. She turned back. Please, Richard. I loved her, too. Nothing can be done now. You can accomplish nothing. But he was already moving, the Mriswith cape flying behind as he swept down the hall. He saw only enough of what was around him as he moved swiftly along to follow the directions she had given him. He moved toward the council chambers the way his arrows flew to the target when he called it. Guards were everywhere, but he paid them no heed. He had no idea if they paid him any, nor did he care. He flew single-mindedly toward his target. He heard the movement of men-at-arms around him in the side halls. He barely noted them on the balconies. At the end of a column-lined hall stood the doors to the council room. As he marched down the hall, men moved in front of the doors. He only dimly noticed them. He saw only the doors. His sword still hadn't left its scabbard at his hip, but the magic was coursing through him at full fury. The soldiers closed rank before the doors. He didn't slow, the black cape billowing open, his brow set in a glare as he charged ahead. They made their move to stop him. Richard marched on. He wanted them out of his way. The power came by instinct without conscious effort. He felt the concussion. In his peripheral vision, he saw blood hit the white marble. Without missing a stride, he emerged from the ball of flame in a gaping hole twice the size the doorway had been. Huge chunks of stone hurtled through the air, trailing smoke. Debris rained down about him. One of the doors spiraled through the air in an arc. The other spun like a top as it skittered across the floor of the council chamber, along with ragged pieces of armor and shattered weapons. At the far end of the room, men behind a curved desk rose angrily to their feet. As he advanced relentlessly onward, Richard drew the sword. The unique sound of steel rang in the huge room. I am Supreme Counselor Thurston, the one in the center at the tallest chair said. I demand to know the meaning of this intrusion. Richard was still coming. Be there one of you who did not vote to sentence the mother confessor to death? She was sentenced to death for treason, legally and unanimously, sentenced by this council. Guards, remove this man! Men came running across the vast floor, but Richard had already closed on the dais. The counselors drew knives. Richard leapt to the top of the desk with a scream of rage. The blade cleaved Thurston in two from ear to crotch. A swing to each side took off heads. Several of the men tried to stab him. They weren't close to fast enough. The sword found every robed figure, including the ones who tried to run. It was over in seconds. Before the guards had made half the distance, Richard leapt back atop the desk. He stood in the grip of unbridled wrath, holding the sword in both hands. He waited for them to come. He wanted them to come. I am the seeker. These men have murdered the mother confessor. They have paid the price of murder. Decide if you wish to be on the side of dead cutthroats or on the side of right. The ring of men slowed their advance, looking tentatively to one another. Finally, they stopped. Richard stood panting. One man looked back at the hole in the wall where the doors had been, and then glanced over the debris scattered across the floor. You are a wizard? Richard met the man's eyes. Yes, I guess I am. The man sheathed his sword. This is wizard's business. It's not our place to challenge wizards. I'll not die for something that's not my place. Another sheathed his weapon. Soon the room rang with the clatter of steel being returned to hangers and scabbards. They began leaving. 
the room echoing with the sound of their boots. In a matter of moments, the vast council chamber was empty but for Richard. He sprang down from the desk and stared at the tall chair in the center. It was about the only thing not dripping with gore. That would have been the Mother Confessor's chair, Kaylin's chair. She would have sat in that chair. Woodenly, Richard sheathed the sword. It was over. He had done everything there was to do. The good spirits had deserted him. They had deserted Kalin. He had sacrificed everything to see right done, and the good spirits had done nothing to help. To the keeper with the good spirits. Richard dropped to his knees. He thought about the Sword of Truth. It had magic. He decided that he couldn't count on it working for what he needed now. Instead, he drew the knife at his belt. He had done everything there was to do. Richard put the point of the knife to his chest. With cold precision, he looked down to make sure it was pointed at his heart. Kalin's hair, the hair he had taken from the hawker, stuck from his shirt. Richard pulled the lock she had given him from his pocket. She had given it to him to remind him she would always love him. He wanted only to end his uncontrollable agony. She is awake, Prince Harold said. She is asking for you. Kalin finally pulled her gaze from the flames in the hearth. She darted a cool glance at the wizard sitting next to Addie on a wooden bench. Though Zed had recovered his memory, Addie had not. She still thought of herself as Elda and was still blind. Kalin crossed the dark dining hall. When they had arrived, the inn had been deserted, as had the rest of the town, for fear of the advance of the Celtish forces. The empty town was a good place to rest in their run from Aidendrill. Two weeks on the run had left them all in need of a rest and a little warmth. A week out of Aidendrill, their little company, Zed, Addy, Ahern, Jebra, Chandlin, Orsk, and Kalin, had been intercepted by a small force led by Prince Harold. Prince Harold and a handful of his men had escaped the slaughter of his forces in Aidendrill and had lain in wait. When Queen Cyrilla was taken out to be beheaded, he made a daring raid, and in the confusion of people come to see the execution, he snatched his sister from the Axeman. Four days after joining with Prince Harold, they encountered Captain Ryan and his remaining 900 men. They had wiped out the Imperial Order to a man. It had cost them dearly, but they had carried out their mission. Even her pride in them failed to rally her spirits, though she refused to betray that to those men. After she wrung out a cloth in the basin, Kaylin sat on the edge of her half-sister's bed. Cyrilla was aware, as she was from time to time, though she always slipped back into the dazed stupor before long. When she was in that state, she saw nothing, heard nothing, and said nothing. She simply stared. Kaylin was heartened to see her tears now, as it meant she was awake. When she was alert, only Kaylin could talk to her. The sight of men sent her either into a screaming fit or back into a stupor. Cyrilla clutched Kaylin's arm as Kaylin wiped the cool cloth over her brow. Kaylin, have you thought about what I said? Kaylin pulled the cloth back. I don't want to be the Queen of Galia. You are the Queen, my sister. Please, Kaylin, our people need a leader. I am not fit to do it now. She clutched her hand tighter to Kaylin's arm. Tears poured forth. Kaylin, you must do this for me, for them. Kaylin wiped the tears with the cloth. Cyrilla, things will turn out well. You will see. She clutched a fist over her belly. I cannot lead now. Cyrilla, I understand. I do. Though they did not do to me what they did to you, I was in that pit. I understand. But you will recover yourself. You will, I promise. And you will be the queen? For our people? If I agree, it would only be temporary. Only until you have regained your strength. No, she moaned. She sobbed, hiding her face against the pillow. Don't. Please. Dear spirits, help me. No. And then she was gone again, gone into the visions. She went limp, still as death, staring up at the ceiling. Kalin kissed her cheek. Prince Harold waited in the darkness outside the door. How is my sister? The same, I'm afraid. But have faith, she will recover. Kalin, you must do as she asks. She is the queen. Why can't you be king? That would make more sense. I must fight on for our people, for all the Midlands. I cannot devote myself to the struggle if I'm burdened with concern over being king, too. I'm a soldier, and I wish to serve in the way I know. It is what I was meant to do. You are an Amnel, daughter to King Wiborn. You must be the Queen of Galia. Kaelin started to flip her long hair back over her shoulder, but it wasn't there. It was hard to forget the habits of a lifetime. 
to remember that her hair was chopped short. I will think on it, she said, as she started off. She stood once more before the fireplace, the only source of light in the dining hall, staring into the flames, watching the once living things turn to ash. Everyone avoided her and left her to herself. After a time, she realized Zed was standing beside her. She was only now beginning to get used to him in those fancy robes. He held his cup out. Why don't you have a sip of spiced tea? She didn't look up from the flames. No, thank you. He rolled the cup in his palms. Kaelin, you can't go on blaming yourself. It is not your fault. You wear lies poorly, wizard. I saw the look in your eyes when I told you what I had done, remember? I've explained that to you. You know I was under the spell cast by the three sorceresses, and only great emotional shock could break it. Anger could do the task, but once anger is brought on, it must be allowed to rage uncontrolled if it is to break the spell. I have told you how sorry I am for what I did to you. I saw the look in your eyes. You wanted to kill me. He watched from under his eyebrows. I had to do that, Mother Confessor. Kalen, I told you, I am no longer the Mother Confessor. Call yourself what you will, but you are who you are. Denying the name does not make it so. And as I told you, I had to do that too. To bring on a death spell, the person to be spelled has to be convinced they are to die, or it will not work. Once the anger brought back my memory, I knew I had to use a death spell, so I simply used what was happening to do what had to be done. It was an act of desperation. Had I not done it in that way, people would not have believed they saw you beheaded. Kalen shuddered at the memory of that magic. As long as she lived, she would never forget the chill touch of the death spell. You should have used magic to destroy that council of evil instead. You should have saved me by killing those men, and then everyone would have known you were still alive. Everyone there was under the madness of hate. Had I done that, then we would have had the entire army and tens of thousands of people chasing after us. This way, no one chases us. We can now proceed with what must be done. You can proceed. I have quit the cause of the good spirits. Kalen, you know what would happen if we were to give up. It was you yourself last autumn who came to Westland to find me and tell me that very thing. You helped convince me that if we abandon the side of magic, of right, of helping those who are powerless, then the enemy is handed an uncontested victory. The spirits saw fit to leave me without help. They stood by as I delivered Richard into the hands of the Sisters of the Light. They let me hurt him. Let him be taken from me forever. The good spirits have chosen their side, and it is not with me. It is not the good spirits' job to govern the world of the living. It is our job, the job of the living, to tend our own world. Tell it to someone who cares. You care. You just don't realize it at the moment. I've lost Richard, too, but I know that I cannot allow that to deter me from right. Do you think Richard would love you if you were really the kind of person who could abandon those who needed your help? She said nothing, so he pressed the attack. Richard loves you partly because of your passion for life. He loves you because you fight for it with everything you have, with the same ardor as his. You have already proven that. He was the only thing I ever wanted out of life, the only thing I asked the good spirits for. And look what I have done to him. He thinks I betrayed him. I made him put a collar around his neck, the thing he feared more than death. I am not fit to help anyone. I only bring harm. Kalen, you have magic. I have told you. Magic must not be allowed to die. The world of life needs magic. If magic is extinguished, all life will be impoverished and could even be destroyed. No one knows about the forces we have. We will go to Ebenezer. No one will expect that and pull the Midlands forces together from there to strike back against them. No one will know we have brought Ebenezer back from the ashes of death. All right. If it will still your tongue, I will be the queen. But only until Cyrilla is better. The fire crackled and popped. Zed spoke in quiet admonition. You know, that is not what I mean, Mother Confessor. Kaelin said nothing. She bit the inside of her cheek to keep from crying. She would not let him see her cry. The wizards of old created the Confessors. You have unique magic. It has elements to it that no other magic has, not even mine. Kaelin, you are the last Confessor. Your magic must not be allowed to die with you. 
Richard is lost to us. That's the way it is. We must go on. Life and magic must go on. You must take a mate and give the world that magic into the future. Still, she stared into the flames. Kalen, he whispered, you must do it to prove Richard's love and faith in you. Slowly, she turned to the room behind. Orsk sat cross-legged on the floor beside Chantelin. Only he looked at her with his one eye, the scar across the other looking white and angry in the firelight. He watched every move she made. Everyone else in the room tried to appear furiously engaged in their own business. Orsk, she called. The huge man sprang to his feet and crossed the room. He stood hunched before her, waiting word whether he was to fetch her a cup of tea or kill someone. Orsk, go up to my room and wait for me. Yes, mistress. After he had bounded up the stairs, she slowly crossed the room. She could hear the bed creak when he sat on it, waiting. As she put her hand to the newel post, Zed put his over it, stopping her. Mother confessor, it does not have to be him. You can surely find one more suited to your likes. It makes no difference. I have already touched him with my power. Why harm another for no more than this? Kalen, I'm not saying it has to be now. Not this soon. I am saying only that you must come to accept it, and at some point it must be. Today, tomorrow, next year, what does it matter? It will be the same in ten years as it is today. Wizards have been using the confessors for thousands of years. Why should I be any different? I may as well get it over, so you will be content. His watery gaze stayed on hers. Kalen, it's not like that. This is the hope of life. She felt a tear roll down her cheek. She could see the pain in his eyes, but she showed him no mercy for it. Call it what you will. That does not change what it is. It is rape. My enemies could not accomplish it. It took my friends to rape me. I know, dear one, how well I know. She started up the stairs again, but his hand on her arm stopped her. Kalen, please, do just one thing for me first. Go for a little walk to think things over and ask the spirits for guidance. Pray to the good spirits. Seek their direction. I have nothing to say to the good spirits. It is they who wish this. They have sent you to give me guidance. His thin hand stroked her short-cropped hair. Then do it for Richard. She stood staring at him. Finally, she glanced out the back door to the small frozen garden at the back of the inn. It was just dusk outside. Kalen stepped down. For Richard. Chapter 70 Richard sat in Kalen's tall chair, stroking the long locks of her hair. He had pulled them out of his shirt, not wanting to stab himself through her hair. He didn't know how long he had been sitting there touching her hair, lost in memories of her, but he noticed it was just turning dark out the windows. Richard laid the hair carefully over the arm of the chair and picked up the knife once more. In a daze of anguish, he put the point to his heart. His knuckles were white around the handle. It was time. At last it was going to be over. The pain would end. His brow creased. What was it Mistress Sanderholt had said? Kalen had told her of him? He wondered if Kalen had told Mr. Sanderholt anything else, maybe a last message for him before she died. What could it hurt to ask? He could die then. Richard pulled Mr. Sanderholt from her kitchen into a small pantry lined with stores. He closed the door. What have you done, Richard? I killed her murderers. Well, I can't say I'm sorry about that. Those men did not belong on the council. Let me get you something to eat. No. I don't want anything. Mistress Sanderholt, you said Kaylin told you of me. Is that right? She didn't look like she wished to dredge up the memories, but at last she took a deep breath and nodded. She came home, but things had changed here. Kelton had... I don't care what happened here. Just tell me about Kaylin. Prince Fyron was murdered. She was convicted wrongly of that crime and a whole list of others, including treason. The wizard in charge sentenced her to be executed, beheaded, Richard said. She gave her a reluctant nod. She escaped with the help of some of her friends, killing the wizard in so doing, then went into hiding. But she got word to me, and I visited her. At those visits, she told me of all the things she had been through. She told me all about you. She liked to talk of nothing more. Why didn't she escape? Why didn't she run? She said she had to wait for a wizard named Zed to help you. 
Richard's eyes closed as pain tightened in his chest. And so they caught her while she waited. No, that's not how it happened. Richard stared at the grain patterns on the wood floor while she went on. The wizard she waited for returned. He is the one who turned her in. Richard's head came up. What? Zed came here? Zed wouldn't turn Kaelin over to be executed. Her back stiffened. Turned her in, he did. He stood on the platform before the cheering crowd and ordered it done. I watched as that vile man gave the nod to the Axeman. Richard's mind spun in confusion. Zed, a skinny old man with long, wavy white hair sticking out in every direction. That is he, first wizard Zedicus Zool Zorander. For the first time, a spark of hope ignited in him. He didn't know everything about Zed, but he did know him capable of similar things. Could it be? He grabbed her by her shoulders. Where is she buried? Mistress Sanderholt took him out into the dusk to the secluded courtyard where confessors were buried. She told him that Kalin's body had been burned in a funeral pyre supervised by the first wizard. Then she left him to be alone with the immense marker stone over her ashes. Richard ran his fingers over the letters carved in the gray granite. Kalin Amnell, mother confessor. She is not here, but in the hearts of those who love her. She is not here, he said aloud, quoting from the marker. Could it be a message? Could she be alive? Had it been a trick by Zed to save her life? Why would he do it? Maybe, maybe, to keep them from chasing after her. Richard fell to his knees in the snow before the monument. Dare he hope, just to have his hopes crushed? He put his trembling hands together and bowed his head. Dear spirits, I know I have done wicked things, but I have always tried to do right. I have fought to help people and to uphold your principles of honesty and right. Please, dear spirits, help me. I've never prayed to you in earnest for anything before, not like this. I've never meant anything like this before. Please, if you never again help me, help me this one time. Please, dear spirits, I can't go on if I don't know. I've given up everything to see right done. Please grant me this. Let me know if she is alive. His head hanging, tears dripping from his face, he saw flickers of light on the ground before him. Richard looked up. A glowing spirit towered over him. When he recognized who it was, he went rigid. Kaylin had walked around the garden countless times. Part of her hesitation was dread that she might be granted confirmation of her fear. Finally, she knelt down and folded her hands together on a rock before her. She bowed her head. Dear spirits, I know I am not worthy, but please grant this. I must know if Richard is all right, if he still loves me. She swallowed back the burning sensation in her throat. I must know if I will ever see him again. I have been disrespectful, I know, and I have no excuse but my own failing as a good person. If you grant me this, I will do whatever the good spirits require of me. But please, dear spirits, I must know if I will ever see my Richard again. Her head hung as she cried. Tears dripped from her face. Before her on the ground, flickers of light danced. Kaylin looked up into the face of the glowing spirit towering over her. She felt the warmth of the calm smile from the face she knew. Slowly, involuntarily, Kaylin rose to her feet. Is it really you? Yes, Kaylin, it is I, Denna. But you went to the keeper. You took the mark dark and raw put on Richard. You went to the keeper in Richard's place. The glowing smile of peace swelled Kaylin's heart with joy. The keeper was repulsed by what I had done. He rejected me. I went instead to be with what you think of as the good spirits. In much the same way that what I did earned me peace I never expected, the sacrifices you and Richard have selflessly made for others and each other have merited the granting of this peace to the two of you. Because you each possess both sides of the magic and are linked to me by deeds, before I pass beyond the veil I am empowered to bring you together for a brief time in a place between the worlds. Denna, draped in long flowing robes, spread her arms wide. The luminous folds hung from her arms all the way to the ground. Come, child, come into my arms, and I will take you to Richard. Trembling, Kaylin stepped under Denna's outstretched arm. Richard stood under the illumination of Denna's arm as it came tenderly around him. The world vanished into the radiance. He didn't know what to expect, only that he wanted to see Kaylin more than life itself. 
The overpowering white blaze dimmed to a mellow glow. Kaylin appeared before him. She gasped and then threw herself into his arms. She wailed his name as she clutched him. They embraced without words, just feeling the presence of each other. He felt her warmth, her breathing, her quaking. He didn't want to ever let her go. They sank to the soft support under them. He didn't know what it was, and he didn't care. It was solid enough to hold them. He wanted her arms around him forever. She finally stopped weeping and put her head against his shoulder as he held her tight. At last, she looked up to his face, her beautiful green eyes gazing deeply into his. Richard, I'm so sorry I made you put that collar around you. Richard put his finger to her lips. It was all for a reason. It took me time to understand how foolish I was being and how brave you are. That is all that matters. It makes me love you all the more because you sacrificed your own needs to save me. She shook her head. My Richard, how did you get here? I prayed to the good spirits. Denna came. Me too. Denna made a sacrifice for you too. She took the power of the mark so you would live. Denna gave your life back to me. She is at peace now. I know. He ran his hand down her head, down her short hair. What happened to your hair? A wizard cut it off. A wizard? Well, then I guess a wizard will have to restore it to you. Richard ran his hand lovingly down her hair. He remembered the way Zed had stroked his hand down his own jaw to make his beard grow. It seemed as if from having seen Zed do it, he knew how to do it too. With each stroke of his hand, her hair lengthened. Richard continued to pull from the calm center within him, and her hair continued to lengthen. When it was the same as before, he stopped. Kaylin lifted a long lock of her hair, looking at it in wonder. Richard, how did you do that? I have the gift, remember? She beamed with her special smile, the smile of sharing she gave no other. Kaylin ran her hand down his cheek. I'm sorry, Richard, but I don't like your beard. I like you the way you were before. He lifted an eyebrow. Really? Well, then, since we set you back to right, we will just have to do the same for me, too. Richard drew his hand down his jaw again, pulling the power from the calm center. Kalen gasped in astonishment. Richard, it's gone. Your beard is gone. You made it vanish. How did you do that? I have the gift for both sides of the magic. She blinked in surprise. Subtractive magic? Richard, is any of this real, or am I just dreaming it? And then he kissed her long and deep. Feels real to me, he said breathlessly. Richard, I'm afraid. You're with the sisters. I will never again be able to be with you. I can't go on if you are going to be taken from... I'm not with the sisters. I'm in Aidendril. Aidendril? He nodded. I left the Palace of the Prophets. Sister Verna helped me. Then I had to go to Dahara. Richard told her everything that had happened since he had left her, and she told him all she had been through. Richard could hardly believe the things she had done. I'm so proud of you, he said. You truly are the Mother Confessor. You are the greatest Mother Confessor that ever lived. Go back to the hall before the council chambers, and you will see big paintings of confessors who are greater than I will ever be. That, my love, I doubt. He kissed her again, a hot, passionate kiss. She kissed him back desperately, as if she needed nothing so much from life as to be in his arms kissing him. He kissed her cheek, her ears, and her neck. She moaned against him. Richard, is the scar, Darken Rawl's mark, really gone? He pulled his shirt open to show her. Her hand stroked his chest. It's really true, she whispered. Tenderly, she kissed his chest. She ran her hand over him, kissing where it had been. She gave a sucking kiss to his nipple. Not fair, he said breathlessly. I get to kiss anything on you that you kiss on me. Kaylin looked him in the eye as she unbuttoned her shirt. Bargain struck. She started pulling at his clothes as he trailed wet kisses down her soft flesh. Her breathing quickened with each. Kalen, he managed to say as he pulled away. The good spirits may be watching us. She pushed him onto his back and kissed him. If they truly are good spirits, they will turn their backs. The feel of her warm flesh made his head spin. The feel of the shape of her made him moan with need. Around them, the mellow glow pulsed with their breathing. It seemed to be an extension of their heat. Richard rolled over on top of her. He gazed down into her green eyes. I love you, Kaylin Am now, now and always. And I you, my Richard. As they pressed their lips together, she wrapped her arms around his neck and her soft legs around his. In the void between worlds, in the soft glow of a timeless place, they were one.
Chapter 71 Kaylin strolled back into the inn. She stood in the shadows at the end of the hall leading into the dining room. She still felt the glow, the warmth, the mind-numbing joy and fulfillment. Everyone looked up when they heard her footsteps. Zed shot to his feet. Kaylin! Bags, girl! Where have you been all night? It's just turning to dawn. You've been missing since dusk. We've been searching the town all night for you. Where did you go? She turned and held her hand out. To the little garden out back. Zed stormed across the room. You were not in the garden. She smiled dreamily. Well, that was where I went, but I left that place. I went to be with Richard. Said he escaped from the sisters. He is an Aiden drill. Zed slowed to a stop. Kaylin, I know you have had a hard time of it, but you have simply had a vision of something you wished. No, Zed. I prayed to the good spirits. She came and took me to Richard, to be with him in a place between the worlds. Kaylin, that is simply not... Kaylin stepped out of the shadows into the firelight. Zed's eyes went wide. What? What happened to your hair? The wizard whispered. It's long again. Kaylin grinned. Richard made it right. He has the gift, you know. She held out the Aegeal, hanging from her neck. He gave me this. He said he doesn't need it anymore. But there has to be some other explanation. He gave me a message to give to you. He said to thank you for not closing the opened box of Orden. He said he was glad his grandfather was wise enough not to violate the wizard's second rule. His grandfather? Tears ran down his wrinkled face. You saw him! You really saw him! Richard is safe! She threw her arms around him. Yes, said. Everything is going to be all right now. He restored the Stone of Tears to where it belongs and closed the box of Orden. He called it the Gateway. He said it takes both additive and subtractive magic to do it, or it would have destroyed all life. He gripped her shoulders and held her out. Richard has subtractive magic? Impossible! He had a beard and made it vanish. He said to remind you of the lesson you gave him, that only subtractive could do that. Wonder of wonders. His sharp features came closer. You're all in a lather, girl. He put a stick-like hand to her forehead. You don't have a fever. Why are you sweating? It was hot in that other world, quite hot. He peered at her hair. Your hair is all tangled. What kind of wizard would grow hair back all tangled? I would have grown it back straight. That boy has a lot to learn. He didn't do it right. Kalen's eyes went out of focus. Believe me, he did it right. He turned his head, appraising her with one eye. What were you doing all night? You've been gone the whole night. What have you two been doing? Kalen could feel her ears heat. She was glad she had long hair again. Well, I don't know. What do you and Addie do when you are alone together all night? Zed straightened. Well, he cleared his throat. Well, we... He lifted his chin and pointed a finger skyward. We talk. That's what we do. We talk. Kalen shrugged. That's what we did, too. Just like you and Addie do all night, we talk. A sly grin stole onto his face. He hugged her tightly in his thin arms, patting her back. I'm so happy for you, dear one. Zed took her hands in his and danced around the room. Ahern smiled and pulled out a little flute, playing a bouncy tune. My grandson is a wizard. My grandson will be a great wizard, just like his grandfather. The celebration went on for a few minutes, with everyone joining in the laughing. They all clapped in time with the tune as Zed danced with her around the room. Kaylin saw one person not joining in. Addie sat in a rocking chair in the corner. She had a small, sad smile on her face as she turned her ear to follow them. She went to the old woman and knelt before her. Kaylin took up her frail hands. I be happy for you, child, Addie said. Addie, Kaylin said in a soft voice. The spirit sent a message for you. She shook her head regretfully. I be sorry, child, but it would mean nothing to me. I not remember being this woman, Addie. I promise to deliver the message. It's important to one beyond that you have it. Will you hear the message? Tell me then, though I be sorry I won't know its meaning. It's a message from one named Pell. The room was silent behind her. Addie's rocking came to a halt. She straightened the littlest bit, her eyes filled with tears. Addie's hands tightened around Kalen's. From... Pell? A message from my Pell? Yes, Addie. He wants you to know that he loves you, 
and that he is in a place of peace. He said to tell you that he knows you never betrayed him. He knows how much you love him, and he is sorry you have had to suffer. He said to tell you to be at peace, knowing all is well between your spirits. Addie turned her ear away and looked at Kaelin with her white eyes. Tears rolled down her cheeks. My pal knows I did not betray him. Kaelin nodded. Yes, Addie. He knows and loves you as always. Addie pulled Kaelin into her arms as she wept. Thank you, Kaelin. You could never know how much this means to me. You have given me back everything. You have given me back the meaning of life. I know how much it means, Addie. Addie stroked the back of Kaelin's head as she held her close. Yes, child, perhaps you do. Jebra and Chandelin cooked breakfast while the rest of them talked and planned. Though it would be a grisly job clearing Ebenissia of all the bodies, at least it was still winter, and not the task it would be in spring. From Ebenissia, they would pull the Midlands back together. Kaelin told them that Richard would try to meet up with them in the Galean Crown City, and that he said that then he might need to take Zed back to Westland to see about the Sisters of the Dark, but for now they were safely out to sea. After a good meal, filled with joy and happy conversation that had been missing for so long, they started packing up their things. Chandelin, with an uneasy expression, pulled Kalen aside. Mother, confessor, I wish to ask you something. I would not ask you, except I know no one else to ask. What is it, Chandelin? How do you say breasts in your tongue? What? What is the word for breasts? I wish to tell Jebra that she has fine breasts. Kalen rolled her shoulder self-consciously. Chandelin, I'm sorry, but I meant to have a talk with you about that. I guess with everything that happened, I never got around to it. So talk now. I wish to tell Jebra how much I like her fine breasts. Chandelin, with the mud people, that is a proper thing to say to a woman. It's a compliment. But in other places, it is not taken as a compliment, but as improper, very improper, until two people know each other. I know her well. Not well enough. Will you trust me in this? If you really like her, then you must not tell her this, or she will not like you. But women here do not like to hear the truth. It's not that simple. Would you tell a woman in your village you would like to see her with the mud washed from her hair, even though it is the truth? He lifted an eyebrow. I see what you mean. Do you like other things about her? He nodded enthusiastically. Yes, I like everything about her. Then tell her you like her smile, or her hair, or her eyes. How do I know which is the proper thing to compliment? Kalen sighed. Well, for now, just stick to anything that isn't covered by clothes, and you will be safe. He nodded thoughtfully. You are a wise mother confessor. I am glad you have Richard back as your mate, or you would surely have chosen Chandelin. Kalen laughed and gave him a hug. He returned it warmly. Outside, she saw to the men. Captain Ryan, Lieutenant Hobson, Bryn, and Peter, and others she knew. They were infected by her smile and good cheer. In the stables, she checked on Nick. Chandelin had stolen him back when they fled Aidendrill. The big warhorse neighed softly at her approach. Kalen rubbed his gray nose as he nudged his head against her. How you doing, Nick? He nickered. How would you like to carry the Queen of Galea to the palace in Ebenissia? Nick tossed his head enthusiastically, anxious to be out of the stables and off into the brightening day. Water dripped from melting icicles at the edge of the stable roof. Kalen looked out over the hills. It was going to be a rare, warm day in the winter, but soon it would be spring. Mistress Sanderholt was surprised when Richard took another bowl of soup and chunk of bread. Mistress Sanderholt, you make the best spice soup in the world after mine. In the kitchen beyond, the help was busily going about breakfast preparations. She closed the door. Richard, I am pleased you are so much better. I was worried you would do something terrible last night you were grieving so. But this is too much of a change. Something must have happened to make you have such a turnaround in spirit. He looked up at her as he chewed. He swallowed the bread. I will tell you if you promise to keep it a secret for now. It could cause serious trouble if you told anyone. I promise then. Kalen is not dead. She stared blankly at him. Richard, you are worse than I thought. I myself saw. I know what you saw. The wizard you saw is my grandfather. He used a spell to make everyone think she was executed, so they would not be hunted down, so that they could escape. She is safe. She threw her arms around his neck. Oh, dear spirits, be praised. Indeed, Richard said with a grin. 
Richard took the bowl of soup outside to watch the dawn. He was too exhilarated to be cooped up indoors. He sat on the vast steps, looking around at the magnificent palace soaring up all around him. Towers and spires and sweeping roofs loomed in the early dawn light. As he ate his soup, he watched a gargoyle atop the edge of a nearby enormous frieze supported by fluted columns. The pink clouds were just beginning to glow behind it, silhouetting the grotesque hunched shape. Richard had just put a spoonful of spice soup in his mouth when he thought he saw the gargoyle take a deep breath. Richard set the bowl down. He rose to his feet, his eyes never leaving the dark shape. It moved again, just a little twitch. Gratch? Gratch, is that you? The shape didn't move. Maybe it was just his imagination. Richard held his arms open wide. Gratch, please, if that's you, forgive me. Gratch, I've missed you. It was still a moment, and then the wings stretched out. It leapt from the corner of the building and swooped down in a glide toward him. With a flutter of wings, the huge gar landed on the steps a short distance away. Gratch, oh, Gratch, I've missed you. The gar watched with glowing green eyes. I don't know if you can understand, but I didn't mean what I said. I was only trying to save your life. Please forgive me. Richard loves Gratch. His wings fluttered. A cloud of breath came from between long fangs. His ears perked up. Gratch lug, Gratch arg. The gar bounded into Richard's arms, knocking him to the steps. Richard hugged the furry beast and Gratch enfolded him in arms and wings. Each stroked the other's back, and each grinned in his own way. When they finally sat up, Gratch hunched down, staring curiously at Richard's face. With the back of a huge claw, he stroked Richard's jaw. Richard felt his smooth face as he smiled. It's gone. I'm not going to have a beard anymore. Gratch's nose wrinkled in disgust. He let out a gurgling growl of displeasure. Richard laughed. You'll get used to it. They sat together in the quiet of the dawn. Do you know, Gratch, that I'm a wizard? Gratch gurgled a laugh and frowned dubiously. Richard wondered how a gar could know what a wizard was. Gratch never failed to astonish him with what he knew, with what he could grasp. No, really, I am. Here, let me show you. I'll make fire. Richard held his palm out. He called the power from the calm center. Try as he might, nothing happened. He could not make so much as a spark. He sighed as Gratch howled in a roar of laughter, his wings flapping with the joke. A sudden memory came to him, something Denna had told him. He had asked her how he had done all those things with magic. She had looked at him with that all-knowing smile of peace and said, Be proud you made the right choices, Richard, the choices that allowed to happen what came about. But do not call arrogance to your heart by believing that all that happened was your doing. Richard wondered where the line was. He realized he had a lot to learn before he was a real wizard. He wasn't even sure he wanted to be a wizard, but he now accepted who he was, one born with the gift, born to be the pebble in the pond, son of Dark and Rahl, but lucky enough to have been raised by people who loved him. He felt the hilt of the sword at his elbow. It had been made for him. He was the seeker, the true seeker. Richard's thoughts again touched the spirit who had brought him more happiness than in life had brought him pain. He was deeply gratified that Denna had found peace. He could want nothing more for her, for someone he loved. He came out of his thoughts and patted the gar's arm. You wait here a minute, Gratch. I'll get you something. Richard ran into the kitchen and retrieved a leg of mutton. As he ran back down the steps, Gratch danced from one foot to the other in excitement. Together they sat on the steps, Richard eating his soup and Gratch tearing into the meat with his fangs. When they had finished, Gratch had even eaten the bone, Richard pulled out a long lock of Kalin's hair. This is from the woman I love, Gratch considered, then looked up as he gently reached out. I want you to have it. I told her about you and what you mean to me. She will love you just as I love you, Gratch. She will never chase you away. You can be with us whenever you want for as long as you want. Here, give it back a moment. Gratch held out the length of hair. Richard took off the thong holding Scarlet's tooth. It would do him no good any longer. He had already called her with it. He tied the long lock of hair to the thong and then hung the whole thing over Gratch's head. With a claw, Gratch stroked the long hair. His grin wrinkled his nose and showed the full length of his fangs. I'm going to go to her now. Would you like to come along? Gratch nodded his enthusiasm, his head bobbing, his ears twitching, and his wings fluttering. Richard looked down on the city. Troops were moving about. 
A lot of troops, Imperial Order troops. It wouldn't be long before they gained the courage to investigate the death of the Council, even if it was at the hands of a wizard. Richard smiled. Then I guess I better find a horse and we can be on our way. I think it best if we were away from here. He looked out on the brightening day. A breeze with a hint of warmth ruffled his mirswith cape. Before long, it would be spring. End of Stone of Tears, The Sword of Truth, Book Two by Terry Goodkind. Read by Nick Sullivan.